Welcome back, everyone. This is your host, the DN What If, here with another exciting fanfiction. Today, we're diving into the story of What If Bakugu Mother Henid Class 1A. A special shout out to the original creator, Blowing Your Mind. This is the permission statement by the author in written. Please make sure to show your support by checking out their work from the description. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more fanfiction content just like this. Now, let's get started with the fanfic. Momo was used to the undressing stares, those eyes filled with lust and intent that she would never know if they would act upon. She came from a very proper family, her mom taught her to hold her tongue and sit pretty from a young age. So even now, passing by the group of men whose eyes trailed down her body, she didn't utter a word only ducking her head and pulling her coat tighter around her body. Her footsteps echoed throughout the mostly unoccupied streets. It was getting dark. Her and a good half of her class had met up at Ojiro's house to have a study session. She would have preferred it to be at her house, but Ida set up a schedule so that they could transition study locations. She was thankful that Ojiro lived a walkable distance away from her residence because her driver was unavailable and her parents were at a meeting in another country. She could manage, she reassured herself, even if she felt the hungry gazes of the men still lingering on her. Yayarozu picked up her pace, fingers making indents into the strap of her satchel filled with workbooks. No, she wouldn't turn around and tell the creeps off, it wouldn't be worth it to spoil her family name over a few harmless stares and catcalls. However, her thought process shifted when they started to trail behind her in a way that wouldn't be noticed by an untrained citizen. Cursing herself mentally, she scanned the area. She was only halfway to her house, cutting through the suburbs to make her trip shorter. No one seemed to be out. She was on her own. To make it worse, she couldn't use her quirk without a quirk license. Above her, the streetlights flickered to life, casting a halo around her, though she knew that a ring of light wouldn't keep her safe. She needed to get out of there. The group behind her was now taking long strides, closing in on her. It was then that a crazy idea popped in her head. The class roster. Being class presidents, her and Ida owned digital copies of the other students' contact information and addresses. Yayarozu discreetly as possible slid her phone from out of her skirt pocket to pull up the files. She sent another sideways glance out of the corner of her eyes to get a closer look at her stalkers. Four men feigning non-chalice, chatting and lighting their cigarettes. At least they were staying back for now. Focusing on the screen of her phone, Momo tried to keep her cool as her shaky fingers glided over the screen. Her brain wasn't even comprehending what she was typing or what she was reading. She needed to think. Momo scrolled through the address list, zeroing in on the closest one, a house about a block down from where she was at the moment. A jolt of uncertainty arose when her dark eyes landed on the last name. The Bakugus. The situation wasn't that bad. Maybe she could just? The men behind her grew silent. No, she couldn't get out of this on her own. She inhaled deeply to gather her nerve before typing in the home number on her keypad. Momo held her breath while the line rang, then went dead. Shit. She frantically dialed it again, waiting in anticipation until a clicking sound secured her connection. Finally, Momo thought she'd never be so elated to hear Bakugu Katsuki's rough voice. Who the fuck are you and why the fuck are you calling so late? The voice grumbled, gravely from, asleep? Had Katsuki been asleep? Momo tried not to feel like a bother for waking up a classmate for her issues, but that didn't matter now. She knew what she had to do. She squared her shoulders and strode with a new propose. Hey babe, I'm almost there about a block away. Her dark eyes darted to any notable landmarks. Just got to the mailboxes. There was a shocked silence on the other end of the line, then shuffling. Fucking ponytail? That you? Bakugu hissed, Yayarozu couldn't tell if he was pissed or confused. Probably a mixture of both. Yes, sweetie, I told you I was walking home, didn't I? Momo's smile felt strained on her face, but she continued with the act, only hoping that Bakugo would catch on. There was even more shuffles and grunts. You're at the mailbox ponytail? Bakuga's voice was oddly blank. Was he trying to be soothing? Momo was surprised to realize that it was working. Her shoulders were slightly less tense with the prospect of someone coming to her aid. Yeah, babe, I'll be home soon, okay? 
She tried not to let urgency seep into her shaky voice. I'm coming, ponytail, you hear? The line went dead. For a split second, Momo allowed relief to replace the dread. Then a bony hand lay itself on her shoulder. She jumped slightly, cursing the tiny squeal that slipped past her lips. She was a strong, capable woman, she told herself, she could get out of this without any bloodshed. Momo turned around, fingers clamping tighter to her satchel strap. Oh, how how can I help you? She shivered at the cold looks she received. These stares were different than most of the other ones she's gotten. They weren't admiring from a distance like some of her classmates or treating her as eye candy as some other adults did. No, these were the eyes of a predator studying their prey. These men would do what they wanted to her and no one could stop them. Momo's breaths came out in ragged pants as she backpedaled out of their reach. Sfine young lady. One of them drawled, a cigarette perched between his lips. We're just making sure you get home safe. Momo straightened herself up to at least appear confident. I do not need your help, thank you. She shrugged off another lingering hand. Have a good night, she said through gritted teeth. Now that Yayorozu got a closer look at the four men under the streetlight, they all looked shockingly similar to each other. The same ratty clothes, build, posture. Momo scowled to herself, that was certainly strange. She pushed those thoughts aside. She had more urgent needs at the moment like getting out of there. She could figure out the specifics later when she was no longer in harm's way. Easier said than done. The quadruplets were persistent, following her with identical crooked smirks on their faces. Wait, they weren't following her, they were hurting her. Leading her to somewhere they could take her away easier. Headlights momentarily blinded her vision. This is it. They were taking her to a vehicle that they could stuff her in. Momo stumbled, swallowing down a helpless sob. The gravity of the situation settled into the pit of her stomach. She needed to use her quirk if she were to make it out in one piece. With unsteady fingers Yayorozu reached to unbutton the bottom of her shirt. She needed to make a staff, or pepper spray. Anything to buy her some time. Hey Demis, a familiar voice called. Momo almost burst into tears right there on the spot. Bakugu. The car next to her slowed down to a stop. The window rolled down to reveal a puff of ash blonde hair and sharp red eyes zeroing in on her. Get in, he jerked his thumb to the passenger side of the car. Momo wasted no time following the order. As she settled into the leather seat she noticed Bakugu, clad in sleepwear, snapping pictures of the four creeps. Get out of here fucking extras. Bakugu barked. That seemed to ward the men off. They grumbled and retreated, heads turned low. Bakugo rolled his eyes and rolled his window back up before turning back to Momo. They didn't fucking touch you, did they? Yayorozu quickly shook her head, wiping away a tear. Thanks to you. I don't know what I would have done if you haven't shown up. I can't thank you enough for your assistance dash. Bakugu's eye twitched. Shut the fuck up. H huh? I said Bakugu's piercing eyes held contact with hers. Shut. You know what you would have done, Ponytail. You were capable of getting out of that on your own just fine. Yayorozu gasped softly, eyes filling up with more unwanted tears. He was right. She would have fought them tooth and nail. She was about to. The warmth of courage spread though her stomach. Then why did you come? She smiled softly, watching closely as Bakugu studied the road ahead of him. Cuz dumbass, I'm gonna be a hero, he scoffed, as if he didn't just save her life. And you gotta have courage if you're gonna save others' lives. So I suggest you get to pack and ponytail cause you don't got enough of that. Despite his harsh words, Bakugu's tone was soft. Momo understood what he was saying as clear as day. She needed to speak up for herself. Who cares about her family name when her own life is on the line? They settled into a comfortable silence, both reaching a whole new understanding of each other. That was how Bakugu worked. Yayorozu finally understood. He spoke with actions, not words. Which made all the more difference in the end. Bakugu, how are you driving? Shut the fuck up. Are you telling me you don't have a license and you're driving? I said shut the fuck up or I'm giving you back to the creeps. All things had a system, it was a way of life. It was routine. Now Kirishima wasn't usually one to stick to routine, being in possibly one of the most unpredictable friend group in UA. But he liked that. 
He enjoyed the spontaneous and unplanned moments in life. But there was one routine that always stayed in place, no matter the hour, no matter the circumstances. Walnox, Kirishima and Bakugu shared a wall in the dormitories, making them dorm buddies. Of course, Kirishima was ecstatic to hear that him and his best bro were close to each other. Even if he always got noise complaints for pumping his music too loud during his workouts, but hey, it's not his fault Bakuga decided to go to bed at 8 o'clock. Besides, there were many benefits that outweighed the small problems. He was now passing his classes due to Bakuga's aggressive teaching method. He got free meals. Not only that but they were top quality. Man, Bakugu was going to spoil him of all other food. There were many, many other things he could list, but there was always something that he loved the most. Seeing Bakugu care. Katsuki often didn't show any affection towards anyone outside their friend group, but when he was alone, he was much quieter. Softer. He still held that aggressive demeanor, but it was less defensive. He could relax around him, and Kirishima enjoyed that. And that's when the wall knocking came into play. That was when Kirishima got to see Bakugu Katsuki at his weakest, and vice versa. They had suffered through many situations that normal teens should never have gone through, so of course they were going to have nightmares. Sometimes they could become too much, growing into that paranoia out of the dream state. Where the shadows moved and untested minds could only conjure up what lurked behind them. When that happened, they needed each other. Thus began the knock system. Two knocks for I'm okay, and three for I'm not. When Kirishima would hear Bakugu pop off explosions late into the night, Aijiro would knock in question. Most of the time, Bakugu would knock back twice, but occasionally there was three. And Kirishima would book it to his room without hesitation. It also happened to him. Sometimes he would knock three times on purpose, just to see Bakugu's face. Kirishima felt selfish for it, but he couldn't help it. Was it gay to cuddle the homies? Normally Kirishima would say no, but with the way he was there for all of Bakugu's emotional crisis and the way he held him together after he fell apart, Ajira was starting to think that yes, it was. And he didn't have a problem with that. But now, Kirishima didn't want to see him at all. He didn't want to see anyone. Ajiro thought that those horrible depressive episodes from middle school were a thing of the past. But apparently not. He hadn't thought of them in a while. Those weeks, or even months of laying in bed with the shades drawn. Of his room being littered with dirty clothes and overdue homework assignments. Yeah, he didn't like looking back on it. But now he was forced to. He felt it coming, like a tsunami after an earthquake. Anxiety settled at the pit of his gut the days before it hit. He ignored it at first, continuing with his grueling hero training. But once his fiery motivation slowly drained away along with his appetite, he knew he couldn't ignore it anymore. Well, maybe he's been putting it off for a while now. After all, there was no reason to feel depressed anymore. He had friends now, more confidence in himself. There was no reason to be sad anymore. No reason to be depressed. Yet he was. Why was he? He felt bad about feeling bad for himself when he had everything he could have ever wanted. Aijiro chuckled humorlessly to himself, twisting around and kicking his bed sheets off. Why even try to sleep? He knew it wasn't going to work. He would just continue to wallow in his self-pity. Kirishima eyed the weight rack set up in the corner of his room. He really should continue with his routine, but what was the point? No matter how much muscle he gained after middle school or how much he dyed his hair, he was still the same weak kid from before. He would probably lose all of the hard-gained work he trained his body anyways. Why not just make it sooner? Thus began the wave of depression. Kirishima was acting strange. For a week straight he's been avoiding group hangouts, not even leaving his room. Screw that. If Bakugu was forced to attend those shitty group game nights then Kirishima had to go too. That crappy excuse of, sorry guys I'm tired, wouldn't work forever. Although... Bakugu did notice the bags that have grown under his bloodshot eyes, and how sluggish he's been in class. He didn't even scarf down the meals that Bakugu usually made for him. Was that shitty hair avoiding him? Was he finally getting annoyed with him and all of his crappy emotional baggage? Well screw that extra, he didn't need him. Is what Bakugu would normally say but, uh, Kirishima was his only friend, and Bakugu hadn't felt the way he did for him ever, for anyone else. 
Not shitty Deku, not those losers from Aldra Middle School, and not the idiot squad that followed him around now. Kirishima was special, and it didn't take an idiot to see. Bakugu was going to get to the bottom of this next time he saw him. Kirishima didn't even come out of his dorm to eat over whole weekend. The trays Bakugu left at his door remained untouched. Ungrateful. He wouldn't do that for just anyone. It was Monday now, and he didn't even show up to school. He had been attending classes for the past week even if he wasn't mentally there. But now he would be counted absent. No fucking friend of Bakugus was going to skip classes. He definitely needed to drag him out of that godforsaken room now. Hey, Pinky! Bakugu yelled. Ha! Huh. Mina tilted her head in question as she sat her bag down on the desk. Almost late to class as usual. Bakugu clenched his fist, grinding his teeth. He really didn't want to ask for any assistance. But if it was for Kirishima? You know what's up with shitty hair? Ashido slouched low into her chair, her bubbly demeanor swiftly changing into a closed-off one. Not sure. Bakugu leaned over his desk and narrowed his eyes. You're lying. The other pursed her lips, deep in thought. Bakugu sighed and similarly slouched down into his own seat. Never mind is fine. And no, the conflict was still clear in Mina's eyes, but her posture was still with resolve. This isn't the first time this has happened, but it's been a while. Bakugu for once remained quiet, allowing Mina to continue to speak. I'm not sure if he would want me to tell you this, but I'm worried about him. I would help him but I don't know how, so, maybe you can? Get on with it raccoon eyes, I gotta know what it is before I can help them with it. Ashido nodded. Right. So in middle school, Ijiro wasn't the happiest? Katsuki tried to ignore the way his given name rolled off of her tongue so naturally. He couldn't think about that right now. He was depressed. He had a hard time with school and self-confidence. It wasn't that hard to believe. Even now Bakugu could recognize the insecurities that Kurishima still bore. But there were times when he was absent for days on end, and the days he did appear at school, he was sluggish and unfocused. Much like how he's been last week. I think he's... It hit Bakugu the exact moment she said it. <laughs> Having a depressive episode... Bakugu cursed himself for not realizing it sooner. Katsuki knew what he had to do. I don't know what to do, Bakugu dash. Don't you fucking worry about him, Katsuki cut her off. I'll handle it. Mina smirked in a way that spelt trouble. Go get your mans, Bahubabe. Bakugu would have exploded her face off right then and there if the bell hadn't rang. Kaminari ran into class, a true buzzer beater. Jiro grumbled, passing money to a snickering Siro. The one time he's not late and I pay for it, she grumbled. Once Bakugu gathered the supplies he set his plan into action. Three knocks on the wall. Katsuki was disappointed when there came no reply. Looks like he'd have to drag him out himself. He obnoxiously stomped down the hallway, grocery bags in hand. He towed the full lunch tray he left in front of his door to the side. Shitty hair. He barked, rapping on the door with his foot since his hands were occupied. Answer the damn door. Still no answer. Bakugu scoffed. Damn it. He resorted to calmly kicking the door down. The smell was the first thing he noticed. The air was stale and smelt of sweat and dust. Disgusting. Bakugu's nose twitched as he stepped in. A pile of blankets, papers, books, and, was that a bulletin board? Moved on the bed situated in the corner of the room. Kirishima poked his head from the pile of rubbish sluggishly blinking. He took out his earbuds. That explains why he never returned his knocks. Bakugu? He asked, squinting at the light. Yeah dumb ass, Bakugu grunted, avoiding the clothes covering the floor. D what a fucking mess. What are you doing here? Ijiro asked, throwing the blankets off of him to swing his legs around. Idiot, it's Monday and you didn't show up to school. Figured I'd drag your ass out. Kirishima blinked scratching at his exposed roots. Oh, sorry. Bakugu waved him off, flicking on the lights. Get up. Ijiro furrowed his eyebrows. What? Why? First of all, Bakugu shook his grocery bags. We're re-dyeing your shitty hair, your roots are showing. Second of all, I haven't seen you eat so I'm sitting you the fuck down, and you'll eat everything I make you. Bakugu kicked the clothes scattered across the floor into a neat pile. Then, we'll fix this dump of a room. All right? 
Aijiro rubbed at his tired eyes that somehow looked worse than when Bakugo last saw him. No dude, you don't have to do any of that, I'll be fine dash. Bakugo snatched Karishima's wrist, dragging him to a standing position. I don't take no for an answer. He sniffed. You're also taking a shower? I'm sure you can do that yourself? Kirishima nodded vigorously. Bakugu turned away as he lead Kirishima to the bathroom. Was he doing this right? Were you supposed to force someone out of their shell like this? He shook it off. No, he was already doing it, he couldn't stop now. If Kirishima really wanted to remain how he was, then he wouldn't be tagging along. Bakugu set the bags down on the bathroom counter. Luckily Nedzu modified the dorms to where each floor had their own personal restroom. He didn't have to worry about anyone interrupting their time because most of the class agreed to go out to grab dinner. All right, Bakugu growled, snapping on the latex gloves. Sit the fuck down. Kirishima slowly lowered himself onto the bench in front of the mirror. Under the luminescent bathroom lights, he looked even more exhausted. Katsuki sighed, moving behind the other to section off his hair. I hope you fucking conditioned your hair the other day. If you didn't then oh well. Despite his lecturing tone, Bakugu made sure to lower his tone to a mutter. Kirishima seemed to appreciate it as he leaned into his touch. Bakugu gently twisted Kirishima's hair, nimble fingers working magic. He wouldn't dye someone's hair unless he was doing it the best way possible. Bakugu? Kirishima finally asked, breaking the semi-comfortable silence. Hmm. Why are you doing this? Thief because idiot, no friend of mine is going to sit around on his ass all day dash. Oh, really? Kirishima tilted his head to Ibakugu, his eyes steely. That's not it. Katsuki stared back into those unblinking eyes, the only eyes that could ever make him waver. He jerked Kirishima's head so he could continue with his work. It's cuz I fucking care about you, okay? He muttered. Despite the low volume of his voice, he could tell that Aijiro heard. For the first time in a while, a smile broke across that solemn face. Fucking finally. Bakuga didn't realize how much he missed that smile until now. Thanks Baku bro. Yeah yeah, now hold fucking still. They spent the rest of their time in comfortable silence. Bakugu not pushing Kirishima to talk, just letting him relax into the touch. After his wretched hair was fixed and thank God, washed. They headed down to the vacant cafeteria. Bakuga guessed that the class hadn't yet returned from their outing. Yet another small blessing. Kirishima's movements lacked their usual confidence. Bakugu had to stop himself from beating the depression out of him with a spatula. That wouldn't help with shit. As Bakugu turned on the stove, which many other students were banned from, Kirishima hesitantly sat down. Hey bro, you don't have ta cook? I'm not too hungry right now. Katsuki almost chunked the pan at that stupid shitty hair's face. Instead he resorted to pointing it threateningly at him after tying on his apron. Kiss the chef, bitches. Sit the fuck down and shut the fuck up. Kirishima's mouth snapped shut. When was the last time you fucking ate anyways? Katsuki almost didn't want to know the answer. Aijiro held a thoughtful face as he twirled a strand of his newly dyed hair between his fingers. A habit? Bakugo learned that he had since he was in middle school. I ate dinner last night, but you don't need to worry about me dash. Bakugo was going to strangle Kirishima Aijiro. Well someone does if you aren't even going to take care of yourself. He barked, aggressively pouring the batter mix. Breakfast for dinner could cure fucking anything. Kirishima's face fell. Bakugo really hated that expression on him. Okay. Bakugo nodded back. Okay. Kirishima didn't end up eating as much Bakugu would have liked, but it would suffice for now. Especially when the class started trickling back into the commons, shooting them curious glances. Bakugu flipped them all off and dragged Kirishima back to his room. Now for the third order of business, fixing up this messy-ass room. Bakugu could practically hear Kirishima shuffling his feet nervously behind him. No time for dawdling, there was work to be done. And work they did. Bakuga didn't slack off, and neither did he let Kirishima. No dust mite was left, but Kugu killed them and their famos. The clothes were shoved into the washer, two whole loads to be exact. The floor was vacuumed to perfection and the sliding glass doors wiped down viciously. It was late by the time they finally finished, but Kugu wiping his forehead and nodding in satisfaction. 
Man Kirishima huffed, flopping down into his bed. I feel exhausted. You look exhausted. There it was again, those fucking sad doe eyes. Kirishima looked like a kicked puppy. I'm sorry. I haven't been getting much sleep. Bakuga packed away the vacuum cleaner into the closet, rubbing the weird heat away from his cheeks. He wasn't the best at talking and shit, but if it was for Kirishima, if you ever need to talk, or some shit, he trailed off, looking away. Aijiro's eyes widened at Bakugu's silent question, and Bakugu was awarded with a smile so soft that he almost. But, he fucking did it. That sad ass face was gone, obliterated by Bakugu's pure strength and willpower. No foe, not even Satan himself, could top him. Kirishima pulled the comforter around his shoulders, poking his head out from his blanket. Well, it looked like Bakuga's job was done. He moved to flick off the lights, but halted when Aijiro called out to him. What you say? Couldn't hear. Kirishima cleared his throat, a blush rising to his cheeks. Can you, can you stay? I, I haven't been able to sleep well in a while and I just thought it would help if... Yetimasel stay. Bakuga confirmed, moving to sit on the edge of the twin bed. The redhead once again smiled as he laid back. Don't be so stiff Baku, Kirishima whined, pulling him down with him onto the bed. You don't have to stay the whole time, just until I fall asleep? Bakugu rolled his eyes, crawling up to face Kirishima. I'll stay for as long as you want shitty hair. They lay there in surprisingly comfortable silence for a while. For some reason, the situation just felt natural. Like there it was where Bakugu belonged, laying next to Kirishima. Bakugu pulled the blanket up to his nose, already drifting off to sleep. He didn't care if he could still feel Kirishima's gaze resting on him. It was past his bedtime and he was tired. Hey, Baku, what? It's just, what are we? Kirishima shifted around, bangs falling into his round eyes. Bakugu wasn't stupid, he knew this question was coming. Frankly, it's been overdue for a while. He rubbed the sleepiness away from his eyes to analyze the other's expectant face. Whatever you want to be, Kiri. Kirishima edged closer, reaching out to cut Bakugu's face. I'm sure you know the answer to that. Bakugu grinned lazily, placing his hand atop the others. Night guy. Good night, Ket. It wasn't a secret that Urarika wasn't the most well-off, but she didn't like advertising it. She felt lucky enough as it was being able to stay in the fancy dorm building with her friends. With them she didn't need to worry about when she would get her next meal. Of course the missed her parents and worried about their well-being, but at least they no longer had to pay for another mouth to feed. Yeah, whatever made her feel better. She occasionally snuck some snacks from the dorms to replenish their pantry, but not enough to be missed. Which lead her to her current situation. A large tray covered with foil sat on the countertop. Normally she would ignore it, but upon closer inspection, there was a name written on the pink sticky note stuck to it. Her name. The penmanship was neat, if she were to guess, Yayarozu was the one who left her the food. But how could she possibly know when Urarika would go downstairs to gather food before the weekend break? It was always on Friday morning at midnight sharp when the commons were completely unoccupied. Maybe she left it out as leftovers and she didn't notice? Well, Ochako wasn't about to question her motives, now she had a meal that would last a while. She swiftly collected the tub of casserole. Thank God for Momo's leftovers because the meal looked absolutely delicious. As she crossed the commons to get back to the girls' side of the dormitories, but a sight stopped her dead in her tracks. A hand hung off the side of the green couch, relaxed and pliant. What the heck? Once she creeped towards the couch, Ochako was surprised to see that it was Bakugu of all people who was passed out on the couch. He lay on his back, other arm draped across his stomach. His workbook forgotten on the floor. He must have fallen asleep studying, Urarika realized. Just as she was about to put her prized casserole down to shake him awake, a hand placed itself on her shoulder. Urarika jumped in surprise, letting out a small squeak. Hey hey, don't wake him up. Kirishima whisper yelled waving his blanket-occupied hands around. Ochako let out a puff of air, thankful she didn't drop her food. Kirishima? She whispered back, what are you doing here? The reed head shrugged. Was looking for Bakubro, he wasn't in his room. I guess he fell asleep down here. 
Uraraka watched as Kirishima draped the blanket over Bakugu, who subconsciously tugged it closer to himself. It was strange seeing his usual scrunched-up face replaced with a neutral one. Hey wait, why were you going to his room at midnight anyways dash? Ijiro placed a hand over her mouth. No reason, go put up your food before you drop it. Right. Food took priority at the moment. She could wonder why Kirishima was going to Bakugu's room later. Or she could forget it, that could work too. The meal was immaculate, something Yurarika expected to get from a restaurant. Man, Momo sure was a great cook. Her and her parents savored the meal that weekend, it was a nice change of pace compared to the rice and beans they usually ate. And as a bonus, apparently it wasn't a one-time thing. At the end of that week deep into her kitchen raiding hours, yet another tub of food was on the counter. Wrapped in foil with a pink sticky note stuck to it, the meal sat there gloriously. She really needed to thank Momo Yayorozu, she was a godsend. An angel from the heavens. Bless her soul. The meal this time was an American-style lasagna, how did she even know how to make that? On instinct Ochako passed by the couch, happy to at least see Bakugu made it to bed this time. Even if he left a blanket and his workbook on the floor, she was in too good of a mood to stomp to his room and yell at him for leaving his stuff out. Maybe she'd do that later. Yet another weekend went by with full stomachs and happy hearts for the Urarika family. Hey Momo, wait up. Urarika called, sprinting after her lord and savior. It was Friday Eve, Uraraka's new favorite day. Yayarozu stopped by one as over large doorway. Good morning, Uraraka. How may I help you? Ochako slung her bag higher on her shoulders, narrowing her eyes. What do you mean how can you help me? You help me enough as it is I can't thank you enough for what you've been doing. She bent down into a low bow. P please sit up. Yayarozu stuttered, waving her hands around in a flustered manner. I haven't done anything special. Ochako straightened herself, frown settling on her lips. What do you mean? The food you leave me every Thursday night to take home is wonderful. Momo moved out of the doorway to make room for the arriving students, but never broke confused eye contact with Ochako. I'm sorry to say but I have no idea what you are talking about. Have a good day. She scurried off to her seat. Well, so, Momo wasn't the one leaving her food? Ochako scanned the room, now occupied with her class. If it wasn't her then who was it? Midoriya maybe? Ida? No, none of them could cook. Sato? Possibly. Urarika, do I need to escort you to your seat or are you going to stand there forever? Aizawa stared at her from his sleeping bag, unimpressed. Oh, sorry Aizawa-sensei. She definitely needed to figure this out. Her investigation started with Hagakure. Hagakure, can you cook? Ochako asked bluntly during hero training. They were paired in twos participating in a search and rescue mission to find the victims. I can heat up macaroni cups if that's what you mean, Hagakure's voice answered from behind her. Why? Well, that marked her off of the suspect list. Well, someone's been leaving food for me. It was mouth-watering like American-style lasagna. I didn't think anyone in class could make that. I figured it was Momo, but she didn't know what I was talking about. Ochako huffed, still salty from the memory of being wrong. Well, maybe it's someone like Ida or Sato trying to look after you. I don't think it's any of us girls because, well, American-style lasagna? That's out of our skill set, Toru suggested, then hip-checked Urarika, throwing her off balance. But hey, if this mystery caregiver happens to give you extra, you better give me some. Ochako nodded, of course, once I catch them. She reached to hoist herself up the tree so she could get a view of the forest landscape. Now, let's get to rescuing. Suspect number two. Sato. Urarika decided to corner him on her walk back to the dorms. Sato. She called, pushing past Ojiro and Shoji to get to her target. Oh, hello Urarika. Good saving during training today. The taller student complimented. Aw the dashed Ochako shook her head. She would not allow herself to be swayed by charm. He was a suspect. Ah, uh, are you okay? Ojiro asked, a brow raised. She must have been thinking too hard. Can any of you cook? She blurted, watching the three's faces twist in confusion. I can bake. Sato offered with a shrug. So it's you. 
Ochako stood on her tippy toes to jam a finger to the other's chest. Rikido put his hands up in a surrendering gesture. Ojiro and Shoji shared bewildered looks. Did I do something? Sato asked after regaining his composure. Don't be stupid, you know what you did. What? Ochako lowered her finger, lip trembling. Why you can cook, can't you? Sato shook his head vigorously. No, baking and cooking are two different subjects. I'm learning to cook but I'm not very good at it yet. Ochako let out a wail in frustration and crouched down, defeated. Sato's eyes softened as he lowered himself to sit on the curb next to her. Ojiro and Shoji followed sweet. What's the problem? Maybe we can help? Ojiro offered, Shoji nodding along. Well, Yuraraka explained her story, cheeks still burning from the shame of being wrong for the second time that day. When she finished the other three blinked in surprise. I can see how you came to that conclusion, but it wasn't me, Sato said after a beat of silence. Ochako nodded in understanding. She had jumped to conclusions yet again. But? I may know who is leaving you the food. Yurarika perked up from her depressive state. But before I tell you, I need you to keep an open mind about it. Yurarika nodded eagerly got it. I think the only person in this class who has the capability to cook that well is Bakugu. It was so silenced that you could hear the sound of a pin drop. Then Yurarika snorted. Good one, Sato. Her giggles died down when the other's face only morphed into a grimace. Wait, you're serious? He nodded. So you're telling me that the Bakugu Katsuki is cooking food for me? Why would he do that? I'm not sure, but if you don't believe me then you can check for yourself. You said that he leaves it out at midnight every Thursday, right? Well, that's today. Sato stood up from his crouching position, dusting off his pants. Yes, Shoji agreed stakeouts are the best option to capture your opponent. And with that, Yurarika had her plan. The moon hung high in the sky as Yurarika waited patiently for her target to arrive. It wasn't midnight yet, and she hadn't caught anyone so far from her blanket fort on the couch. Now that they had the time to think about it, the possibility of Bakugu being the secret cooker made more sense. After all, she did find him asleep on a couch the first time she got a meal. And if that wasn't incriminating evidence then Yurarika didn't know what was. And back to him in Kurishima? It was four o'clock in the morning when Yurarika woke up. All that time staking out had ultimately been for nothing, she ended up falling asleep to her own thoughts. Ochako kicked the blankets off of her, tripping over them with a curse. Now she was going gave to wait all the way until next week to catch him. No, she wouldn't go up to him and ask, that would be too easy. She needed to catch him red-handed. Yurarika rubbed at her tired eyes as they dragged her feet to the kitchen where yet another glorious feast was prepared. There were two pink sticky notes this time. Yurarika, don't fall asleep next time pink cheeks, and maybe you'll catch me. Thus, Ochako's lips parted to a wide grin. Maybe it wasn't all for nothing after all. She was going to catch him one night and punch him with as much kindness as she possibly could. Kuda naturally loved the forest. From all of the little critters that scurried around, to the plants that tilted upwards fighting for the sun's attention. The weather was never wrong, even if it was at a downpour. Kuda just appreciated the forest and all of its little glories. Well expect for one. Bugs. They were the only creatures that Kuda would ignore. They stared at him with those little beady eyes, looking as if they had no soul. Kuda wouldn't be surprised if they didn't. But even if he didn't like the insects and bugs, he was still more than willing to go adventuring into the undergrowth. Kuda missed his home in the mountains where his parents were. Where Larry the parrot was, and all of the animals that would previously visit him. When Kuda came up to Mr. Aizawa with his homesickness, the teacher hummed in thought. It's not like he could just visit his home over the weekend, it was too far of a trip to make. How about I give you full access of the forest terrain you did your test on? The teacher asked, gathering the papers he had to grade from his pedestal. Kuda's eyes widened in surprise, not expecting the much-welcomed offer. Aizawa raised an eyebrow, so is that a yes or no? Kuda nodded, smiling brightly. All right, now get out of here I have to grade these papers. Just as Kuda was at the doorway Aizawa-sensei stopped him again. Wait, you should know that another student also had access to the area, so don't be surprised when you see him okay? Kuda thanked him for the warning and slipped out of the room, 
wondering who loved nature just as much as he did. Wow, he really wanted to meet them if he hadn't already, maybe they also had a nature-related quirk? Bakogu Katsuki did not, in fact, have a nature quirk. Really, it was more of a quirk that could destroy nature. Though he never did, there was no point in ravaging plants and small critters. He'd rather explode Deku than a poor squirrel. He respected the terrain so it wouldn't make sense messing it up with his explosive hands. Every weekend before Yue, Bakugu would take an hour-long train ride to the mountain's hiking trails. When he was lucky, his parents would let him camp out at night. Hiking and rock climbing was a good form of exercise, and doing it as religiously as Bakugu had, he was in peak form. Though now that he was in Yue, he had to adjust his training schedule. He managed to pull some strings so that he could visit the forest terrain and climb the mountain there, but he couldn't do it every day. He opted to aerial acrobatics and gymnastics to be able to efficiently move while using his quirk. He was surprised to find that he liked the outcome. Sure he would love to be the most built, but he needed to be leaner for maximum use of his quirk. Bulking up was more fitting for Kirishima and his sturdy quirk. Whatever, he would be the best anyways. Bakugu kicked a nearby rock, hefting his hiking bag further up his shoulders. He got Aizawa's permission to spend the weekend camping out on the forest terrain. When he put in the request the teacher scrunched up his nose in distaste and waved him off. Whatever, not my free time. Though I have no idea as to why you would want to spend the whole weekend there. That damn Deku and Canadian flag asked where he was headed with all of his hiking gear, but he just flipped them off and walked out of the dorms. Like hell he was telling them where he was going, this was his alone time, and his only. Though sometimes he would spare a text to Ijiro. The game plan was to set up camp somewhere by the sheer rock face. He should be done setting up around midday, then he would climb up the mountain to get in a good workout. He missed being able to rock climb every weekend, but this would have to work for now. It took a while to find a good clearing under the cliff side, but once he did he set his bag down, setting to work. Bakugu traveled light wherever he went, not seeing the need in packing more than what he absolutely needed. As planned, it was around midday when he completed his work. An orange sleeping bag rolled out with logs he had collected stacked by it. He held a lighter in the pocket of his black cargo pants. It wouldn't rain, but Kugu checked the weather frequently. It was actually the perfect weather, cool enough to not sweat through his tank top, but warm enough to not be freezing. Adequate camping weather. Bakugu popped his knuckles, a feral grin on his face. Right, he growled, slipping on his gloves. The cliffside was an easy level, so Bakugu could free solo it. He liked the feeling of relying on himself, of no harness weighing him down. He liked to dig his fingers into the rocks, leaving his fingernails cracked and raw. Bakugu wasn't crazy, he just loved rock climbing. He lost himself into his thoughts as he scaled up the rocks with a self-satisfied smirk. As he got closer and closer to the top, his arms and legs burned in a good way. He had no choice but to go forward or fall and die, so he pushed himself, grin never leaving his face. As he grew closer to the finish line, he heard, noises? Gee, get away! A meek voice yelled. Has he heard that voice before? Katsuki hauled himself with shaky arms up to the top. He allowed himself to catch his breath before taking in the scene before him. When he saw it he almost wanted to throw himself down the very cliff he just climbed up. Animal Shit Talker was the one who had cried out for help. He was cowering against a tree, covering his eyes. What the fuck? Katsuki hauled himself up, discarding the now empty water bottle to the side. Flutter shy, what the foo dash? A bug. Animal Bitch was hiding from a caterpillar. Bakugu put a hand on his hip, pinching the place between his eyebrows. When Kuda finally noticed him, he looked on with wide eyes. Bakugu shuffled closer, his legs feeling like overcooked noodles. He bent down to gather up the insect in his hands. You can calm the fuck down now, this shitty animal ain't gonna hurt you. Kuda relaxed, putting his hand to his mouth and flicking it out. The hand signed for thank you. He must have been scared if he used his actual voice to call for help. Bakugu sighed, setting down the caterpillar on a nearby branch gently, signing your welcome back. Bakugu felt Kuda watching his curiously as he sat down against a nearby tree, pulling out a granola bar. Don't be a bitch, come sit down. 
Bakugu switched back to his normal voice, not seeing the point in signing when Kuda could hear him just fine. The only reason he knew sign in the first place was because of his quirk. Kuda quickly sat down, still on the lookout for bugs. Bakugu snorted. How ironic. Your quirk is to communicate to animals yet you can't even stand up to a little bug. The other only nodded, fiddling with the grass below him. Tisi, you just gonna take my shit like that? Bakugu grumbled, shoving the bar into his mouth. Kuda shrugged. Fucking Elaine. Why were you here anyways? Katsuki asked, running a hand though his spiky hair, shooting a glance to the side. Strangely, he wasn't salty that another student was here. Well, if it was one of those loud morons like Dunce face then maybe he'd be a bit pissed. Homesick could have signed, a sad look on his face. Yes, multiple classmates annoyed the shit out of Bakugu, there was always one little thing. For Kuda, it was how he never spoke for himself. A hut now, Bakugu understood. Well, at least the homesick part. Looks like they were both feeling it. Yeah. Kuda pointed at Bakugu. You? I'm fucking rock. Climbing. Bakugu answered. At least you could spend your time training instead of being scared of insects? Bakugu was trying to get a rise out of him, and it wasn't fucking working. Kuda just sat there, that same sorrowful look on his face. I am training. Huh. Then it clicked into place. Kuda was out in the woods training, trying to get over his fears. A smirk grew on Bakugu's face. So he wasn't useless after all, and where there was a will there was a way. As long as Kudo was trying, then Bakugu wouldn't discredit him. In fact, he was feeling extra helpful this weekend. Hey Fluttershy, you got access to this place whenever you want right? Kuda nodded. Bakugu stretched as he got back up from his sitting position, legs feeling significantly less flimsy. Thud. Come back to the same place tomorrow, same time. Kuda's eyes widened in surprise, mouth agape. Bakugu arched an eyebrow, is that a yes? Another nod. No classmate of Bakugu's was going to be scared of something as harmless as a fucking bug. Good. Bakugu slept as well as he could that night, considering he was sleeping in a sleeping bag on the hard ground. But he didn't care, it reminded him of camping in the backwoods of his house. His fire was out when he woke up, a good thing. If he lit the whole forest terrain on fire Aizawa would kill him. Of course, Bakugu was responsible so he wouldn't let that happen in the first place. Bakugu climbed up the cliff face around the same time he did yesterday, this time quicker. He half expected to be welcomed to a clear space when he hauled himself up. But Animal Bitch was there, as promised. Huh, so he might not be such a wimp after all. All right, Bakugu panted, you ready Fluttershy? Kuda nodded, a determined look on his face. Bakugu chugged down his water bottle shoving it back into the large pocket of his cargo pants because he wasn't a litterer, damn it. I'm gonna grab a bug, and you're not going to freak the fuck out this time and run. Can you do that? He asked, already in search for an insect. He didn't bother looking back to see the other's reaction. He knew he had no way out now. Uh, there it is. Bakugu held a finger out to the praying mantis. This little fucker ain't gonna hurt you, okay? Bakugu lowered the volume of his voice as he held out the insect to show Kuda who gulped. Shit, he was practically quivering in his boots. At least he could look at the bug. That was progress compared to yesterday when he was closing his eyes. You see what it's doing? It's just sitting on my finger, nothing shitty about that. Look, bugs are just living their short miserable lives like us. How'd you feel if people were scared of you? If they were rude to you for no fucking reason? Kuda looked taken back by Bakuga's words as he continued. And it's your job, Katsuki poked a finger to Kuda's chest. To make sure they're okay. Aren't you like the protector of nature and all that bullshit? Well, I hate to fucking break it to you, but insects are a part of nature. Kuda was now slack-jawed, not paying attention to his greatest fear in Bakugu's hands, but instead on his words. He was right, and he's been neglecting those poor creatures this whole time. He was supposed to be their voice, their companion. He sniffled, wiping away the tears from his eyes. I'm sorry he spoke, his voice wobbly. Bakugu smiled, but this time it wasn't the cocky one he usually sported. It was more soft. Don't tell that to me, he lifted his palm up, tell him. Kuda stared at the insect for a solid minute, studying it of any dangers. Bakugu was being surprisingly patient. Slowly he held his hand out. 
The praying mantis transferred from Bakugu's calloused hand to his own sweaty one. He didn't bite him, in fact his legs tickled. Bakugu watched closely as Kuda held the bug a big higher, eyes filled with compassion. I am sorry little one, I have neglected you when I shouldn't have, will you ever forgive me? The green insect tilted its head, but based on the smile that broke out on Kuda's face, Bakugu could guess that it was a good response. He set the bug down, wiping off his hands on his pants. Thank you, he signed. Bakugu raised an eyebrow. Don't thank me just yet, flutter shy, you're going to apologize to every damn insect in this shitty forest. Kuda was glad that he now knew Bakugu Katsuki. Not as the explosive classmate who called him rude names, but as the one who cared about others. Even if he didn't show it. There were some that hated winter, and some that liked it. Tsu Azui fit in the first category, becoming next to useless during the cold weather. She would like winter if it didn't bother his quirk so much. Her limbs grew heavy and her movement stalled. She was compelled to just sleep the winter away. There were other students in the class who disliked winter just as much as she did. They fit in the winter hate club and tended to stay inside while everyone else had snowball fights. Bakugu was a notable member, though he never talked and only appeared in the commons when he absolutely needed to. Now, winter was in full swing. It was colder this year than it had been any other year, to their bad luck. Some students were ecstatic about it, such as Uraraka and Kirishima. They were the sunshines of the class, Kirishima managing to drag even Bakugu wherever he wanted. Though, Azui had a suspicion that there was another reason for that. Her suspicions were proved correct when Bakugu showed up to school that day wearing one of Kirishima's hoodies. She didn't blame him though, today her limbs felt extra heavy. Yurarika had to slow down her pace just so she could walk Azui to school. She usually made sure to walk on Todoroki's warm side, but him and Midoriya had left before them. Azui shivered as she took her seat. She could tell this winter wouldn't treat her well. Thun thun thun. Morning cat. Kirishima greeted as he stepped out of his dorm, slipping his hand into Bakugus. You're fucking late, Bakugu grumbled. It was too early and much too cold to be yelling. I know, sorry, Kirishima rubbed the back of his head sheepishly as they entered the elevator. I was up all night watching that Crimson Riot documentary. Bakugu rolled his eyes, of course he was. Did you sleep okay? Kirishima asked, eyeing him knowingly. Bakugu averted eye contact, but there was no use in lying. Woke up a few times, s whatever. Ijiro didn't watch him with sympathy, and for that Katsuki was thankful. Instead, he squeezed his hand, pulling him out of the elevator. It's okay, we'll get through it. Come on. It's snowing today. Wonderful. In the most sarcastic way possible. Bakugu winced against the cold weather, scooting closer to Karishima's side to gain heat. Ijiro didn't seem to mind, only smiling fondly. Wow, you really hate the cold, huh? Bakuga didn't bother replying, his teeth were clattering too much. They passed Azui and Uraraka, who walked at a snail's pace. Kirishima frowned, tilting his head back to look at them. What's up with Tsu? Is she okay? It took a long moment for the name to click in Bakuga's head. Frog face? Don't be rude, Kirishima chastised, but yeah. She's been really slow during training. Another cold breeze blew past, Bakugu pulled his earmuffs closer. He knew Kirishima was looking at him, but he didn't care. Think about her quirk, hair for brains. It took Kirishima a second to pick it up. Ugh. She's like you. She gets cold super easily, doesn't she? Bakugu would have face palmed if he wasn't about to become a fucking popsicle. Hibernation. Kirishima shrugged, close enough. Frog Face's slow movement didn't affect Bakugu personally until training. It was a rescue hostage scenario where one person played the hostage, held somewhere in ground beta. The rescuers had to search for them before the timer ran out. Of course Bakugu had to play the fucking hostage. He couldn't do shit, just sit inside some musty-ass lair bound to a chair, freezing his ass off. This was officially his least favorite training exercise. He had to push back the paranoid panic every time he heard the smallest noise. No, he was fucking fine. He was in Yue, not that hellhole. They could have at least used rope to tie him down. Of course those fuckwads had to be extra and use metal handcuffs. If he had that pink bitch as a partner she could have just melted through them. If he had Ijiro he could just cut through them. 
Unfortunately, life never gave him what he fucking wanted. So he waited. And waited. And fucking waited. Bakugu was preparing to bite through the handcuffs himself by the time she finally got there. Bakugu Karo? She called, voice weak. When she turned the corner, the first thing he noticed were her half-lidded eyes and slow movements. Holy fuck. Why did he have to be partnered with the fucking amphibian? Oi, frog face. Bakugu tried to yell, but it came out muffled. Fuck, he forgot about the gag. He couldn't even stomp his feet to get her attention, then being tied to the legs of his chair. Fuck that. Bakugu pooped off a small explosion. She finally turned her head in his direction. About time. There you are, she stated calmly. Lazius. As soon as the gag around Bakugu's mouth was untied, he spat on the floor, getting the bad taste out of his mouth. Get me out, Frogger. Ajui looked at him as if she was pondering what ice cream flavor to pick out. I can't do that, Caro. X fucking cues me? I'm too cold to do anything useful. Bakugu shivered. She was the cold one? At least she could move around. And she had that long ass hair. What are you saying, frog face? I am saying that we should throw the towel. The other groups are already done. I wonder why. Bakugu spat. And there's no we in this. I am not about to fucking quit, I'll just get out of here myself. Ajui watched blankly as Bakugu kicked the legs of the chair with the back of his calf, puffs of breath crystallizing in the air. After a minute of struggling Bakugu coughed, lungs feeling like liquid nitrogen had entered them. You can't produce acid or some shit? They both knew the answer to that. Of course it was too fucking cold. All of the other teammates got carried back if they couldn't break through the chair. Ajui explained slowly. But my strength right now won't allow me to do that. Then push past it. Bakugu was fucking cold and crabby. Isn't this what this school's about? You gotta get over whatever hibernation shit you're going through if you're going to be a good fucking hero. Ajui looked down in shame. He was right. Yet the energy was sapped from her bones, leaving her to feel like a limp rag doll against the cold winter wind. I'm sorry, Bakugu Kuen. No, don't dash. It was too late, she had already pressed the red button on the communication device. The button Bakugu had never dared to press. The withdrawal button. A blinding rage filled Bakugu as his other teammate yielded against his will. This was fucking outrageous. The cuffs on his hands seemed to dig in as he panicked. He audibly grinded his teeth. The chains, the chair, the unforgiving environment. He was back at the league. No one would let him out, he was trapped and alone. No, he wouldn't lose. But he couldn't get out, damn it. He didn't realize how far into the panic attack he was until a hand was placed on his shoulder. He jerked back to avoid the touch, blindly lashing out on the hand. That hand. Wasn't the league's though. It didn't look like any of theirs, held in front of his face in a calming manner as if to say, I mean no harm. Then he was back shivering uncontrollably from a mixture of the cold and the panic attack. His hands were untied and he was sat against a wall. Aizawa sat in front of him, looking on with hidden worry. Was he saying something? Breathe Bakugu. And he did. His face was wet? Why? He was crying. Bakugu viscously wiped the tears from his raw face. Damn it, he couldn't cry in front of these people, he wasn't as weak as that damn frog face. Are you okay now? Aizawa asked. Bakugu simply whacked his hand away, pulling himself into a standing position. It was a wonder his legs were holding up. I, I can't believe you, you fucking did that. Bakugu hissed, cursing himself for stuttering. Aizawa simply steered him away from Frog Face, who looked even more guilty than before. As they walked back to the meeting ground where all of the other dipshits were, Bakugu hung his head in shame. Aizawa still kept a hand on his shoulder, waiting for his legs to give out from underneath him. Bakugu felt the questioning glances, but he let himself be lead by his teacher to Kirishima. Thank for Hey cat, the reed head mummers softly, pulling him closer to his chest. The biting cold was blocked by the jacket being draped along his shoulders. Take him. Dorms, dismissed, he faintly heard Aizawa say, but was too exhausted from the episode to properly pay attention. My? The fault, Frogger said to the group. Bakuga didn't care anymore. He just let Kirishima take him back to the dorms. So, 
Kirishima started, slipping off the shirt of his school uniform to replace with a red tank. You gonna tell me what happened? Bakugu only pulled the blanket closer to himself, burying his head into a pillow. The embarrassing events played back into his mind, his anger had melted into a heavy annoyance. No. Ijiro gave him such a soft look that pre-relationship Katsuki would gave gagged. Cat, come on it's okay, you're not with them anymore, it's just me here. The redhead crawled onto the bed next to him to sit. Bakugu took a steadying breath, scooting around to get a better view of his boyfriend. I was with the league again. Kirishima remained quiet as Katsuki explained the failed training exercise. By the time he was finished Kirishima had laid down next to him, hands stroking through Katsuki's hair. That wasn't very good of Tsuji he agreed. I don't think it was the right thing to do, throwing in the flag when you didn't want to. But if it makes you feel better, I don't think Aizawa sensei will count it against you. Especially if the chains sent you into a panic? Katsuki nodded, too tired to reply. Ijiro snorted Kmir. He held his arms out, allowing Bakugu to place his head against his chest. His heartbeat calmed him down and Kirishima knew that. And hey, I know you're pissed at Sue right now, but maybe she just needs a bit of motivation? Fuck no. Just a little push? Do it yourself? A little Bakugu motivation? I'll fucking think about it. Now stop talking you're my pillow, and last I checked pillows couldn't speak. Kirishima chuckled, fine fine. The training didn't end up counting against him, thank fucking god. His perfect record was not dirted. But that frog bitch had been avoiding him. If she was going to be fucking weak like that and walk away from every situation then Katsuki had nothing to say to her. He also didn't want one of his classmates to simply be weak. If he was going to train against these fucking people then he was going to need some real competition, and going up against a frozen ass amphibian wasn't going to do jack shit. He needed to just fucking think. The idea came to his head on one of his weekend snowboarding trips. Sure he hated the snow, but that didn't mean he was gonna be a wussy and skip out on exercise. Fuck that. His idea would probably make training faster with frog bitch. His parents' new clothing line was coming out. When they asked him if he wanted to model for this line, he said fuck no. It was too cold. Despite popular belief Bakugu actually listened to his parents when he wanted to, and they taught him a shit ton in clothes design. He called up Ijiro and told him his idea. That's wonderful Katsuki. I knew you wouldn't let her slump last. Bakugu rolled his eyes fondly yeah yeah, I gotta get to fucking work on it. Alright bye babe. Whatever bye. So you didn't know how to approach Bakugu. He was a ball of anger and she was the cause of its distress. She wasn't planning on avoiding him for any longer, she knew she needed to apologize. But how? Uraraka and Midoriya were sympathetic of the situation. Ida and Todoroki just told her to go up to him. That's a no. Though they were pretty disappointed in her actions at first, they quickly forgave her. She just needed to forgive herself. But in the end, it looked like she didn't even need to approach the violate student. There was a box in front of her door. It wasn't neatly decorated or anything, just a tan shoe box with neat kanji written across it. To woo frog face. Had Bakugu sent her a gift? He was the only one who called her that. She would appreciate a less insulting nickname, but small victories. She carefully picked up the box and made her way to Midoriya's room. She wasn't taking the chance opening the box alone in case it was a snake. Or better yet, a gift. She couldn't be the only witness either way. After she knocked Midoriya gave her a questioning look before opening his door wider as an invitation. Tsu? Why are you here it's almost curfew? Ribbit. Bakugo left this package for me at my door. She answered, handing off the shoe box to the other, who studied it closely. Yep, that's Kachin's handwriting he murmured, shaking the box lightly. But why'd you bring it to me? I didn't want to open it alone, Karo. Midoriya's green eyes darkened slightly. He may be violate but he wouldn't do such a thing as trap a gift. Kachin's not like that. He's more of an upfront person so if he had an issue he would face it head on. So you looked down at the box, he was right. She had been jumping to conclusions again. But let's see what's inside. Midoriya switched his tone back to a chipper one, reaching to lift the lid off of the shoebox. What was revealed was... Material? Izuku gawked as he lifted the green jacket out of the box. 
It had a design that matched her hero outfit. The material, feel it? Tsuyu carefully took the jacket from Izuku, running her fingers along the fabric. It was wonderful, the best thing she had ever felt. It was warm and cozy, yet thin and expandable to get around easier. A note fell out of the jacket. Midoriya picked it up to read it. Dear frog face, you've been slow as... I'm not gonna say that word. You've been slow during training, so do better and wear this. He scanned the rest of the note. Oh, it's got built-in heaters. Tsuyu croaked nervously. Where would he get something like this? Wouldn't it be expensive? Midoriya shook his head, a huge smile on his face. You can't get something like this anywhere. He made it himself. Ashui's soul left her body. Excuse me? Oh yeah. Kakin parents are popular designers. They taught him everything they know. If Kakin didn't want to be a hero, he could easily be a designer. Izuku also knew that he modeled, but that was information for another time. Tsuyu nodded, still in shock. She carefully packed away the jacket back into the box. Maybe Bakugu wasn't as bad as she thought he was. After all, she was the one who jumped to conclusions and let him down in the first place. She nodded to Midoriya. Thank you, Caro. She had a lot of apologizing and thanking to do. My Neta was a pervert. Really, he already accepted his fate. His uncontrollable lust would turn his classmates on him, and he would be kicked into horny jail for a couple of hours. Ciro's tape was really hard to get out of. At first he thought it was a normal teenage thing to just want to touch some girls, but apparently it wasn't. Unless his classmates hid it really well from him. But he had a horny radar that him and his perv kins attained. The only other remotely close classmate was Kaminari. Mineta was used to waking up every day and thinking about girls, walking to school and thinking about girls. Really, he couldn't help that he was a teenage boy. But now, there was something amiss. It was a strange, astronomical, feeling that Mineta has never felt before. Lately he could only think about one person and one person only. Dor from the support department. Well, her name wasn't actually Dor, but they called her that because she was shaped like one. When he thinks about Momo's luscious legs, she popped into his head, the girl with the least assets in the whole school. His whole world was falling apart. When someone smiled at him, he was reminded of that smile of hers. When he commented on her flatter than normal chest, she just puffed out a breathy laugh with a raised eyebrow. When someone was pulling their hair back, the only thought that filled his mind was her shorter than average hair and how it would be impossible to pull it back. What was this feeling? Why was he so obsessed with someone he was supposed to be bullying? He really needed to figure this out, and soon, before it consumed his whole life and his taste was transformed into flat asses and flat chest. That couldn't happen. Like most teenage boys do, Mineta went to a good friend with his new issue. Kaminari. Was he smart? But was he one of his only close friends? Uh, beggars couldn't be choosers. Kaminari, Mineta urgently pulled the other's sleeve when school was let out. I have an issue Ch's lisp was in full swing. Ya yeah, man? What's up? The blonde asked with a raised eyebrow. He waved to Kirishima on his way out of the door, saying he would catch up with him later. Girl problems? Denki snorted, don't you always have girl problems? Uh, but this one is bad unthinkable. Kaminari frowned okay dude, spill. From the beginning. And spill Mineta did. By the end of his explanation they had arrived at the dorms, Kaminari snickering at his expense. Come on dude. He whined this is an issue. It's not that bad bro, you just got a crush. Kaminari shrugged, opening the door to the dormitory. A crush. On Flatty Dash, Kaminari's disapproving look made him shut his mouth. Not cool man. Don't disrespect your crush like that. Sup, Kami? Mina called from the kitchen where she was with Siro and the rest of their squad. Come on, Baku is making food for us. Denki's eyes widened comically. Food? Hell yeah. He pumped his fist in the air before looking back at Mineta. Look dude, you can't control who you do and don't like so don't sweat it too much. Kaminari left Mineta standing at the doorway with absolutely no good advice on his situation. Watch me, I'll dislike her so fast I'll forget who she is. It didn't work. She just wouldn't leave his mind. He tried hypnosis to erase her from his memory, he attempted letting Kaminari zap him during training to fry his brain. 
He even tried asking that brain control kid transferring to their class, but he refused to talk to him. He was out of options. Of course, there was one other option in mind, but it was Spotty. He ran a huge risk of getting blown up, but when he thought hard on it, what other choice did he have? Bakuga bullied his own classmates so he wouldn't judge Mineta for bullying his own crush. Also, Bakuga liked guys. It was no secret, him and Kirishima had been dating for a while. Of course Mineta had no idea why Bakugo would pass up plump chest and thick thighs for rock-hard chest and muscle. It made his nose scrunch up at the thought of it. But he stayed out of their little business. He didn't want to be blown up anytime soon. But if Bakugo liked flat asses and happened to be the only one in their class who had a stable relationship, then it looked like he would have to ask. He would go to Kirishima but he didn't trust the redhead not to blab his issues to Kaminari, who I'm turn would smirk in victory and say, I told you so. Mineta shivered at the thought. <laughs> Reluctantly, he knocked on the door in front of him. All of the courage left him when the explosive blonde jerked open his door harshly, a scowl on his lips. He looked both ways with eyebrows furrowed in confusion before looking down to spot Mineta. Great fuck. Oh hi Bakugu. The other's scowl only grew more prominent. Get on with it, what the fuck do ya want? Can I talk to you? Bakugu rolled his eyes before widening the door. Whatever, just make it quick I have shit to do. Mineta stepped into the neat room, surprised he was even given the time of day. Huh, maybe Bakugu was changing for the best, he didn't believe the rumor when he heard it from beautiful dear Ajui. Bakugu plopped down on his chair, raising his feet up to his pristine wooden desk. Mineta stood there, feeling like a court jester speaking to a king. Get the hell on with it? Bakugu raised an expecting eyebrow. Mineta scrambled to tell him the unfortunate story of his crush. Bakugu showed no reaction, only holding the same passive face. The question that came out of his mouth when he finished the story was not one Mineta had expected. Do you even know her fucking name? A uh, she's from the support course? Bakugu snorted, figured. Like you're one to talk. You probably don't even remember your own boyfriend's name? Mineta tried to come off as feisty but only appeared to look like an upset child. Bakugu leaned in, sadistic amusement never leaving those red eyes of his. Do you want me to fucking help you or not? That shut him up. Look great fuck, I have no fucking idea as to why you would come to me with your puny relationship issues and it's not my problem. Mineta balled his fist and stomped in frustration, you could have told me to leave earlier then. The blonde took a moment to consider something, then a smirk grew on his face. A smirk Mineta didn't like at all. Just stop being a wimp and ask, am out, it'll solve your shitty issues. Uh, what was with the change in attitude? Mineta sweat nervously, nodding rapidly. Yeah, he could do that. Ah, uh, T thanks Bakugu. Katsuki flicked his wrist towards the door. Out, I've heard enough now. Mineta didn't need to be told twice, he bolted out of there. Kirishima dragged his blanket down the hallway to Bakuga's room, reaching out to open the door. But before he could it burst open, a terrified-looking Mineta speed walked away from them. He didn't even seem to notice Kirishima looking on with confusion. He turned around to face Katsuki expectantly, who only shrugged. Do I even want to know? Bakugu hummed, lifting off of his Raleigh chair. He was just having fucking perv issues, like always. Kirishima closed the door behind him, so why'd he come to you? Kmir Bakugu huffed, a scowl on his face even when Kirishima went to wrap him in his blanket big enough for two. Idiot had a fucking crush or some shit on a support extra. Bakugu scoffed, dropping to the bed and bringing Kirishima with him. Ha, huh, and you helped him? Bakugu grinned. Kirishima knew that grin, it was his no good grin. What are you up to? Nothing relevant. Now be fucking quiet I'm tired. At least he'll stay away from the other extras for a while. Kirishima smiled against Bakugu's spiked hair. Of course he was plotting something he always was. But it was a way to benefit the girls of their class. So Kirishima would allow Bakugu to go through with his mostly devious plan just this once. Mineta was finally going to do it. He was going to confront those feelings of loving an ugly girl and he was ready to accept them. Really, it wasn't too bad, it could be worse. Maybe. He just knew he wouldn't be going to Kaminari anymore for relationship advice. He was just as bad as himself. 
Though maybe Mineta could score a few more hot chicks than him, Kaminari just didn't have the same swag. Mineta usually saw this girl on his route to class. It wasn't hard to spot her amongst the school uniforms, since support students tended to wear the same fitness uniforms. At first it just started as him making fun of her but unfortunately it turned into this mess. He was a ladies' man, so there was no way this girl would reject him. He saw the way this girl laughed every time he poked fun at her, it was a genuine laugh. Her small eyes crinkled and everything. Normally Mineta would appreciate a little mascara or eyeliner but this girl wore no such thing. He guessed her eyes were too beady for eyeliner. Whatever. He could get past that if he really tried. He broke off from his normal walking route to UA, instead walking to the support student department. Every student had to come at least once a month to get costume adjustments. When he arrived at the workshop, it was nearly empty. For some reason that girl seemed to always start early on her work. Then his eyes fell upon Bakugu, who was folding his hero costume up into the numbered suitcase. That should fix your problem Bakugu. She concluded, Bakuga already on his way out the door, throwing a nod her way. Oh, hey Mineta. Her freckles crinkled when she smiled. Here to make fun of my flat chest again she snorted, shaking her head humorously. Why didn't his bullying affect her? It's probably for the best that it didn't. No he answered, walking up closer to her. She was relatively tall for a girl, around Momo's height. Oh how he wished his feelings were for her instead of this girl. Maybe he bullied her to the point where he gained a puny crush. He could just pretend like he didn't care. But he had to go through with this, he wasn't a little bitch, and he had to prove it to Bakugu and whoever else questioned him. So, you need a costume adjustment great boy? She quirked an eyebrow, looking up at him from where she was wiping down her workshop table. I actually have a question. She stopped what she was doing to look at him expectantly. Mineta gulped. He knew he was a ladies' man and that he could score any girl he wanted with just a wink, but he had never actually asked someone out. Well, spill. It was wondering if I would want to go out with him. He said in one breath, though it didn't look like he would have to repeat himself, judging by her reaction. Her eyebrows shot up to her hairline, eyes widening like saucers. Mineta found his confidence again. Look, I know it may be overwhelming, a hot dude asking a girl like you out. Mineta? But just hear me out. Mineta? I can't stop thinking about you. I think I gained a crush from bullying you. Mineta? She banged a wrench against the workbench to catch his attention. He jumped slightly, mouth clamping shut. Look, don't take this the wrong way, but it's a no for me. What? Her eyes hardened, I'm a boy. Oh, he trailed off. He was too embarrassed to say much else. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go now. A boy? He had he had just asked a boy out? He had a crush on a boy? Now all of her his joking reactions made sense. If someone came up to Mineta and said he had a flat chest he would laugh along too. And Bakugu. That evil vile no good. He finally got it. He learned his stupid lesson. He wouldn't judge people by what they looked like anymore. He would stop sexualizing girls just for the fact that he didn't want to mistake them for a boy. Never again. The girls were having a girls' night in the commons after school that day, they dragged Bakugu along to cook for them, so naturally Kirishima was with him in the kitchen. Did you notice Mineta's behavior today? Yurarika asked from where she was painting Mina's nails. Bubblegum pink, how she always liked them. Oh yeah, now that I think about it he was totally chill. She replied, the others nodding in agreement. As long as he stops bothering us ribbit, who knows, Jiro added, maybe now that he's less of a creep he may actually have a chance with girls now. Just not with us. The group erupted into laughter, which was only interrupted by Mineta's entrance. Oh, speak of the devil, Hagakure giggled. But they all stopped dead in their tracks when they got a closer look at the boy's face. He looked thoroughly spooked, like he had all day. They slowly got up from the couches to see if he was okay. He held a hand up to keep the girls away abnormal behavior for him. S stopped, his wild eyes darted across the commons and its residents. I, I can't look at any of you the same. Mineta? Momo asked. Stop it, you're creeping us out, Ribbit. And no, get away. Any of you could be a, a boy. He wailed, pushing past the growing crowd to make his escape. The girls all looked to each other in confusion. 
In the kitchen, Bakugu held a small smirk of victory as he stirred the soup. What did you do to him? Kirishima asked, head rested on the other's shoulder with his arms wrapped around Bakugu's waist. It's a long fucking story, now get off, the food's finished. He elbowed Kirishima off of him, earning a whine. Hopefully that grape shit learned his lesson. Ojiro wasn't one of the top students in class and he knew that. He didn't have the brains like Ida and Yayorozu or the cool quirks that Bakugu and Todoroki owned. He wasn't flashy like Aoyama or bound to be a fan favorite like Kirishima. He was just plain. His martial arts skills weren't important in the face of training exercises. Yue was starting to make him realize that maybe being a hero wasn't the correct career path for him. But it was too late to drop out now. He would have to work extra hard to just be seen, so he would. He wasn't one to dye his hair a crazy color that was too out of his comfort zone. Though, he really needed a way to break through that comfort zone. Once he did, he knew he wouldn't be overlooked like always. Unfortunately for him, he didn't know how to change. Something on your mind? Shoji asked from beside him. Shoji was a person of little words, but everyone in class knew that he conveyed his motivation through actions. Could Ojiro be like that? When one of Shoji's many elbows bumped his shoulder he was bought back to reality. Oh, I'm okay, thank you for asking. He felt his quizzical look even if Shoji's mask covered it up. Ojiro shivered, what he would do for a mask right now to cover his numb nose. The winter had yet to end. He had underestimated the frost and went out wearing his normal school uniform. Luckily for Ojiro, they finally arrived at the school. The bell rang, saving him from any further questioning Shoji was going to dish out. Before they entered the class to their half-asleep classmates, two hands landed on his shoulders. He turned back offering a small smile to his tall friend, who would no doubt do much more in life than he ever would. I'm okay, I promise. The other's hands retreated reluctantly as long as you are sure. And no, he wasn't sure. Ojiro knew he wasn't acting like himself, but he couldn't bring himself to care. It's not that anyone noticed anyways, he was usually always quiet. Blimp. Though Shoji and Kuda seemed to be keeping a close eye on him. He was at least thankful for that. Dude, an arm slung itself around his shoulder when they were changing in the locker rooms. What's the issue? Kaminari asked a small frown on his face. Kaminari was loud and boisterous. Maybe Ojiro could be like him? No, that wouldn't be right. What do you mean? Kaminari quirked an eyebrow, nodding to Ojiro's tail, which drooped. It was safe to say it remained like that the rest of the day. His slump went on for another week until a concerned Shoji once again questioned him. It was the same, yes I'm fine, no it's okay? Ojiro had even been lagging on his martial arts training. His master seemed just as concerned as Shoji, though his tough demeanor didn't allow him to show it. Ojiro tried to act normal, really he did, but it was hard when he didn't even have the motivation to do his schoolwork. He could even feel Aizawa eyeing him every time he exited the room, as if mentally suggesting he actually do his work. And he would, eventually. Then came training. He was perfectly fine when they did individual contest. Last week's obstacle course, no matter how physically straining, was better than anything else. He didn't need to talk to anyone, he just went at his own pace. Though it didn't look like he'd be as lucky this week. Partner training. It wasn't that he didn't get along with the others, most were nice. But he didn't want to drag any of them down. How bad would it be to be on a team with him? The only thing he could contribute was hand-to-hand -hand combat. Tail, a voice grunted from behind him, you're with me. Ojiro jumped in surprise at the gruff voice, turning around to face a frowning Bakugu. He sweat dropped. Ojiro had never worked with the violate blonde before, only hearing horror stories about his grueling training from the others. Last training session had ended in a guilt-ridden Ajui and a very upset Bakugu. Though Ajui never told them what exactly happened. Maybe best to stay out of his business. Bakugu stared at him expectantly. Right. Training. Yeah, let's go. Training went about as well as Ojiro suspected it would. It was mostly his fault. What the fuck tail? Bakugu shouted, and Ojiro could practically see the steam puffing from his nostrils. Before Ojiro could get a word in to defend himself the other aimed a grenade gauntlet at him. I'm not going to get any better if I'm stuck fighting weaklings. 
Ojiro escaped the blast by the hairs on his tail. He spent training that day avoiding more explosions, staying on defense instead of attempting to switch to offense. A bang by his head made Ojiro jump and twist around. The locker room was vacant now, well, except for Bakugu who stood in front of him. Fist planted onto the locker next to him, smoke wafting from his clenched fingers. Ojiro must have been zoned out for a while now. Bakugu! Ojiro greeted, turning around to slip his school shirt on. He growled. What the fuck is wrong with you? Ojiro shrugged, starting on buttoning his shirt up. I don't know what you mean. He repeated for possible the fifth time that day. Bakugu scoffed, arms sliding down to cross over his chest. It looked like even Bakugu managed to get dressed before him, even with all of that gear. The fuck you don't? Ojiro chose not to respond. Tails you've been next to useless for a while now. I've been waiting to fucking wipe the floors with you for a long ass time now, and when I finally get the chance you wimp out? Ojiro looked up, surprised. He knew his jaw fell open like a fish out of water, but anyone's mouth would be open if they heard the top student in class wanted to fight you. Bakugu grit his teeth in frustration. He seemed to be looking for the right words. That's a first. If Ojiro knew one thing about Bakugu Katsuki, it was that he always said what was on his mind. Tails, you're one of the most skilled fucking fighters in this class, so act like it. Bakugu finished, eyes burning a hole into his skull. Now Ojiro was even more in shock. Most skilled? He didn't know about that. And why would it even matter if all of the others had awesome quirks? He wouldn't even be able to get close to them. So that's what you're fucking worried about? Shitty ass quirks? Ojiro flinched. Had he said that out loud? Bakugu was practically trembling now. I'll show you, I'll fucking show you and you'll see. He spat on his way out of the locker room. Quirks aren't just your fucking tools, they're a part of you. Don't talk down on them like that. Hold that shit with respect. Ojiro gulped, watching Bakuga's back as he exited the locker room, left thinking of the other's parting message. Then the bell rung. Shit. Kirishima heard the angry stomps before he even saw Bakugu around the corner. And wow, it looked like something pissed him off even more than normal today. Cat. Kirishima greeted once the blonde spotted him his shoulders slouching only slightly. What's up? Bakugu scowled, palms crackling. I need you to fight me. Kirishima nodded in silent agreement, changing his direction to walk in the opposite direction towards the gym. If Bakugu was asking to fight him then that meant he wasn't getting enough physical activity during the day. He needed to burn it off a lot more than others due to the nature of his quirk. He had been coming to him asking for fights a lot more lately. The school hallways were huge, Kirishima still even got lost in them. That's why Bakugu was the one to lead them to the gym. Bakugu got special permission to use it during off-school hours from Aizawa. Halfway through the fight Kirishima realized that there was something still on his boyfriend's mind. He was fighting a lot more fierce than normal. Blast igniting constantly from his palms and his movements a flurry of punches and kicks. It was a deadly dance. Katsuki, Ijiro discovered, was incredible at versatile fighting and hand-to-hand -hand combat. He combined his acrobatic and aerial skills with his quick and stunning strength to create his own style. It didn't go with traditional fighting rules but it's not like the villains were going to follow rules. Or at least, that was Bakugo's reasoning. By the time their water break rolled around they were both panting in a satisfied exhaustion. There was so much smoke in the air that he was surprised the sprinklers hadn't activated or the alarms triggered. Kirishima loved the kind of blissful tiredness that he experienced when fighting all out. He didn't get it often, only when facing Katsuki. So, Kirishima said, voice breathy. You want to tell me what else is on your mind? Bakugu took a long swig of water, wiping his nitroglycerin-spiked sweat with a rag, throwing it in a nearby biohazard can. Something Aizawa requested to be put in every class for Bakugu. S just fucking training. Kirishima sat down next to Bakugu on the sidelines, grabbing another rag for him. Hmm, yeah. The extras don't try fucking hard enough or they're scared to fight me. I need to get this shitty sweat out of my system so I need someone fucking good to go against, someone who tries. He clenched his jaw, explosions muffled by closed fist. Kirishima nodded, maybe we can ask Aizawa-sensei to partner you with me for training exercises? 
I don't need fucking handicap. Katsuki snapped. Cat it's not. Kirishima placed a hand over his boyfriend's. Calm down. Katsuki breathed in shakily, nodding. I was looking forward to fighting tail today, but apparently he fucking lost his spark. I can see how that can be disappointing. I want to fight him at his fullest when he's trying, not half-assing it. Kirishima stood up from the bench offering a hand to Katsuki. Then help him get it back. Do you know how to do it? Bakugu was sharp. Of course he knew what he was going to do. He always did. Ever since day one, Kirishima knew Bakugu was set on becoming the number one hero. He wouldn't let a little hindrance like crappy training partners bring him down. Every Friday was different for the hero course. Meaning that students from both classes came together to convince the teachers on what training exercises they should do. Bakugu was going to win. Like always they gathered around Aizawa and Vlad King, all clad in hero outfits. You know how this goes, the first person with a good idea that we approve of will get the okay from us? Aizawa droned, Vlad King nodding beside him. Many hands were raised and many were called. Boys versus girls? No. We have an uneven number unless you want to be a boy. Maid Cafe? Mineta, this is training. Free Day? Kaminari, yet again, this is training. Until finally, Bakugu was called upon. Corkless sparring. That raised a few eyebrows. Usually Bakugu wanted to fight to the death or have a cork competition. This was new. Is that so? Any specific reason? Aizawa asked in the same monotone voice as always. None of these fuckers can fight without their quirks, they rely too fucking much on them. Is that reason enough? Bakugu replied, and despite the harsh words, he knew he had a point. Half and half and more than half the class sucked ass at hand-to-hand -hand combat. What do you mean Bakugu? Mineta interjected, it's not like you can fight without that quirk of your anyways. Bakugu whipped around to face him, eyes narrowed and teeth barred. Say that one more fucking time fuckface and I'll punch you in the face so fucking hard you'll have to shove a toothbrush up your ass to brush those nasty yellow teeth of yours dash. He was shut up when Kirishima placed a hand on his shoulder, quieting him down. Some other students shook their heads in exasperation. Let's get to it. Quirkless combat matches. Pick your partner and we'll trade off in ten. Vlad King decided taking over for Aizawa who had zipped up his sleeping bag at the start of Bakugu's rant. When Bakugu approached Ojiro, the other looked at least a bit excited, that determined look on his face. There was. Hey fucker. Bakugu caught his attention you and me, you better make up for that half-assed match from the other day. And make up for it he did. Ojiro was surprised with the day's training results. He figured it would be yet another quirk comparing match or rescue training. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat, something he specialized in more than the other students. He didn't even mind that he couldn't use his tail. He was caught off guard when Bakugu wanted to fight him of all people, and got whiplash when they actually started fighting. He was good. Incredibly good. His style was one he had never seen before, unpredictable and spontaneous. A complete 180 compared to his formal training. That was how the other got the upper hand. He wasn't even upset when he lost 20 minutes into the fight. The two classes had gathered to make a ring around them, watching their fight in anticipation. Some even seemed to be making bets. Bakugu took him down with an illegal move. It would be banned in any form of martial arts Ojiro has ever done, and he's done a lot. It ended in a flurry of movement. A flip over his head ended short when thighs wrapped around his neck. They stayed on the floor like that for a minute to catch their breath. Bakugu's muscular legs trapping his head. Ojiro couldn't even move his arms, Bakugu held both of them up. Then came the erupt of cheers. Ojiro was forced to tap out with his tail. Catch up, if you hadn't have been slacking off in your own self-misery for the past few weeks then you wouldn't be so fucking rusty. Bakugu lifted from his position, legs no longer choking him. Now get up, that was puny you can do fucking better. As Ojiro recovered he studied Bakugu as he was handed a towel, his grenade gauntlets remained next to Kirishima, who smiled and clapped proudly. Huh, who knew Bakugu was so wise? And good at combat. Ojiro dusted himself off, a spark of motivation lighting up inside of him. He couldn't quit now, he had to make his master proud. He had to make himself proud. No more being a lazy training partner, 
If he was going to surpass all of these people with their wonderful quirks, then he was just going to have to train extra hard. He could do it, and he had Bakugu Katsuki to thank for that. Hagakure knew she was invisible, everyone did. It was hard to miss a floating pair of clothes. But it was also hard to notice her. She envied Mina for that bright, noticeable skin, and Momo for that amazing body of hers. Hagakure didn't even know what her own body looked like, and could only guess based on her clothes and other factors like weight and height. From what she could tell she was pretty average. She was jealous of pretty much everyone just for the fact that they could simply be seen. They didn't have to attempt to wear flashy outfits to earn a compliment. Hagakure gave up on her hair at this point. Who cares how neat it was if no one could see it? She needed someone to blame this horrible quirk on, but that wouldn't be fair to her parents. Of course, that didn't stop her from complaining to them every chance she got when she was spiteful, but they took it to stride. Man, she didn't deserve such good parents, going out to buy her all of her neon outfits just to try to squeeze the life out of her insecurities. Then came the dorms. It was fun, for once in high school she was included. She knew she was one of the more bubbly people in the class, it was hard to turn off that personality from middle school. If she was quiet she would just be forgotten. But in this class, she knew that wouldn't happen. It was different. But she liked being happy, so she continued on. Then came second semester, picture day. The day Hagakure possibly hated the most. Picture day next Monday during hero training. Wear anything besides the school uniform and I'll have you head. Aizawa announced, causing a ripple of conversation through the room. Oh, I'm going to curl my hair. Mina cheered. Isn't you hair already curly? Shut up Kaminari let me have this. Ashui turned back to you Rarika, what are you going to do Nribbit? The other student shrugged, twirling her hair with her finger. Oh I I don't know I'll have to see. Oh you should let us help you get ready. Mina squealed, the other girls nodding in agreement. At this point the boys learned to ignore their yelled conversations from across the room. That is a wonderful idea. Momo chimed in, all of you girls can meet me in my room before school. Jiro shrugged, feet kicked up on her desk. I don't really care, but okay. She jabbed Kaminari for changing the song they were listening to. How about you Hagakure? Mina asked, all heads turning to her. For once she was glad she was invisible so the others couldn't see the tears rimming her eyes. She shook her head, then remembered that they couldn't see the movement. Huh, busy. They all looked to each other doubtful, even some of the boys who overheard quirked an eyebrow. Busy doing what? Jiro decided to ask. Studying. Yeah. Even Bakugu narrowed his eyes, which was weird. He usually stayed out of all class conversations, barely even paying attention. Hagakure didn't like his crimson gaze on her, it felt as if he couldn't see through her, somehow looking her straight in the eye. She avoided eye contact even if logically, there was no way he could see her eyes. Okay, Momo said uncertainty, well my door is always open. Hagakure couldn't tell if Momo was offering for a study or session or a makeup tutorial but gave a thumbs up anyways. At least she remembered to wear her gloves today. Hagakure had no idea what to do. In middle school she could wear whatever she wanted to picture day and that was how she was spotted. But now, amongst all of the other plain school uniforms, there was no way she would be noticed. And don't even get her started on single pictures. It was just the same old plain background of whatever shot they were taking. She spent the week brainstorming ideas but came up with nothing. She didn't go a minute without worrying. The time was ticking by and not in her favor. It was Friday now. She wished she didn't have to worry about stuff like this. While the others were worrying about what to wear or how to style their hair, she was thinking about a way to be visible which was impossible for the record. At this point she lost hope. She usually didn't let little things like a group picture get her down, but that was the point. She may be included in group pictures and presentations and really anything, but she'll never actually be seen. She wants to be there, solidly. She knew that if she kept her feelings in then she would lash out, and what good would that do anyone? She needed to speak to someone, anyone about her issue to get it off of her chest. Going to a teacher would be too embarrassing, so she would go to the next best person, one who wouldn't tell anyone and knew how to keep quiet. The dorm hallways were dark, it was well past curfew. She shivered into her extra puffy jacket, burying her toes into her slippers. 
Even though they were inside, the cold managed to seep through the dorm's thin walls. She found herself stopping in front of Jiro's door, taking a deep breath before knocking. You gonna do anything for picture day, cat? Kirishima asked, plopping down onto his dorm room bed. Fuck no. Hmm, Kirishima continued, ignoring Bakugu's unenthusiastic response. He twirled a red strand of hair between his fingers. I'm thinking I'll leave my hair down. Bakugu was quick to respond, a little too quick. Do it? Kirishima chuckled, rolling to a sitting position on his bed. You like my hair that much, huh? Bakugu flushed fire truck red. Shut the fuck up. Hey, have you noticed someone acting weird in class this week? Kirishima asked, leaning his head against his hand as he looked down at Bakugu, who was dumping books on his floor desk. No, don't fucking pay attention to those extras. Ijiro huffed, I gave you a chance to guess. Anyways, it's Hagakure. She's usually like super bubbly, but she's gone quiet. Good for her. Maybe she'll fucking put that quirk of hers to good use for once. Kirishima shot him a disapproving look. Don't be mean. Anyways, it started when Aizawa sensei had that talk about picture day. Pay attention, shitty hair we're studying, not chit chatting. Kirishima slid down from his perch on the bed. You don't have to call me shitty hair anymore, babe. Look, I get it, you love my hair and you're trying to cover it up. Katsuki threw a pencil at him. To say that Jiro was concerned was an understatement. She wasn't usually one to worry about people, outwardly at least. She kept to herself and no one had a problem with that. But what Hagakure had told her last night had been nothing short of concerning. The girl had been quiet all week, pondering something that none of the others could figure out no matter how much the others asked her. And now Jiro knew. She knew it all. And was expected to not tell anyone. Another fact about Jiro was that she didn't betray people's trust. Hagakure had told her very forwardly not to tell the other girls. But those were the girls. She never said she couldn't tell anyone else. Jiro had a plan. A plan that would take a lot of convincing, but she was going to pull it off. For Hagakure, who she had a new understanding about. Jiro mentally cursed herself for not thinking about her sooner. After all, being invisible must not be good for self-esteem. She knew what her and the girls could do was limited, but Bakug, yeah, this would require a lot of favors. But she knew that if anyone could pull this off, it would be Bakugu. You want me to? What now? Bakugu asked, rubbing his eyes. Jiro chose to ask him during the best time, when he was sleepy. He was tired he usually just brushed everything off with significantly less cursing than normal. Apparently he had already been asleep for a while, considering he opened the door tired-eyed with a weighted blanket wrapped around his shoulders. It was also a huge bonus that Kirishima happened to be there, standing behind Bakugu at the doorway, hand on his waist. Yeah, Bakugu was definitely tired if he was letting that slide. I told you, I need you to help Hagakure be seen for picture day. Jiro repeated, hands on her hips, conveying that she wouldn't take no for an answer. So what, give her a makeover or some shit? The blonde grumbled, voice rough from sleep. Exactly. Look, Bakugu, I know you can do it. You have the skill and resources, after all, you are a fashion designer's son aren't you? Uh, and a former model? Jiro goaded, a smirk on her face. How in the fuck did you know that dash? That's a perfect idea, cat. You should do it. Kurishima, bless his soul, encouraged. What the fuck ever Bakugu stopped in the middle of his sentence to let out a yawn. Invisibitch can do whatever she wants, I'm sleeping. Turned around. Jiro looked up to Kurishima expectantly after the red head herded Bakugu back to bed. He's going to do it right? Kurishima waved her off, you and I both know he will, even if he doesn't want to. And yet yeah, Jiro did especially since she had information he didn't want to be known. If he knew what was best for him, he wouldn't deny her request. A blackmail. Hagakure had officially lost all hope. She accepted the fact that she wouldn't be seen. It was stupid, she thought, to be sulking over such a small aspect in life. Picture day? Well, at least she could never have a bad hair day. She laughed bitterly to herself as she started to climb into bed. Her depressive musing was interrupted by a series of loud knocks. It was one of the girls. They had created sort of a knock code to use on each other's doors. It was just a fun little game they did for no reason, but Hagakure loved it for the simple fact that she was included. 
She dragged herself off of the bed, taking the comforter with her to the door. Hello? Oh hi Jiro. The other didn't even take the time to greet, pushing past Hagakure into her room. Ugh, it's so dark and messy in here, at least open a window and tidy up. Hagakure shuffled her feet, slippers gliding over the carpeted floor. Yes sorry, I'll do it later. Jiro turned around to face her after flipping on her bedside lamp, a pink one that Hagakure had owned since she was a little kid. I'm not here to bother you about your room. You? Aren't? No, I'm here to tell you to wake up extra early tomorrow and meet me in the commons around. Jiro thought for a second. Five o'clock. Can you do that? Hagakure nodded numbly. Why would she want her up a whole hour and a half before school even started? Just come in your school uniform and bring your bag. Don't do anything special yet. <laughs> Jiro set her alarm for her on her way out. See you in the morning. Oh, night. Hagakure was left to lie in wonder. There were a lot of questions, but it didn't seem like Jiro was willing to share. It looks like she'd have to wait to find out. She closed her eyes. And waited. And waited. She looked to her clock to discover that only a minute had passed. Man, she hated waiting. Bakugu angrily rubbed his eyes. Why am I fucking waking up at fuck o'clock in the morning? was the first thing said when he woke up. Then he recalled how that traitor earlobes blackmailed him. Waking up early wasn't too hard to Bakugu, considering he usually woke up early anyways for his morning jog. But still, waking up early for someone else was a completely different feeling. He despised it. Luckily Kirishima was there to drag him out of bed, or hell would be raised. Nope, you're going to help poor Hagakure, don't you want her to feel better? Kirishima asked, already flicking on all of Katsuki's lights, riffling through his stuff in the closet to find where he knew his makeup kit was. Bakugu sat up in bed, a school uniform thrown at his face. Fuck you. Bukur. I don't give a shit about her, it's her fault for being invisible. Kirishima threw a warning glance over his shoulder, and a pair of shoes. If you're not going to do it for yourself then at least do it for me? Fuck no. Kirishima pulled the goddamn puppy eyes. Fine. Jesus. Hagakure and Jiro were lounging on the couches when the two made it to the commons. Hagakure was confused and rightfully so. Jiro had woken her up even before her set alarm went off. She couldn't be annoyed, it was too early to feel much of anything. Besides, her curiosity only grew when Bakugu and Kirishima entered the room. Well, more like Kirishima dragging a half-asleep Bakugu. His oversized hoodie really bought together the I don't want to be here look. Are you ready? Jiro asked, her earphone jacks lay limp along the tops of her shoulders. Huh, it was too early for even them. Of course. Kirishima's shark-toothed grin was radiant, as always. Then the redhead pushed Bakugu forward, and to the blonde's credit, he didn't even bite off Kirishima's fingers. Get the fuck up Invisibitch. Hagakure flinched at the nickname then was thoroughly thrown for a loop when he said, we're gonna make you noticed. Itcha? Wah? Wah? Was all that came out of her mouth, she quickly covered it with her hands so she wouldn't squeak again. I know you fucking heard me. Now sit the fuck down and stay there. Hagakure plopped down onto the commons couch. She tilted her head to Kirishima and Jiro, who stood to the side. They didn't look too worried, so Hagakure relaxed herself. How, how are you going to do that? I'm invisible. Don't Bakugu pointed a bottle of concealer at her face. Fucking tell me what I don't already know. Hagakure didn't notice the huge makeup kit the two boys had dragged along with them until now. She didn't know how she didn't. It was the largest makeup kit she's ever seen. Makeup? Mm. Bakugu grunted as he pulled out different shades of concealer. Too many for a single person to own. Pick your color, he grumbled shoving the options in her face. Hagakure swallowed thickly when it finally clicked what Bakugu was about to do for her. Makeup? No one had tried it on her before, saying it would be too complicated. And Bakugu of all people? Who knew he could even do makeup, much less own so much. Then those piercing red eyes were on her again, looking directly at her as if she was visible. How could he do that? Huh, did he wear eyeliner all the time? Bakugu snapped impatiently, we don't have all morning, are we doing this or not? Hagakure felt warm tears rim her eyes. She quickly wiped them away. Yeah. Let's do it. 
Time passed slow, yet fast. Bakugu was focused and precise, never seeming to mess up. His makeup skills were truly impressive. If Hagakure didn't know any better, she would think he was a professional artist. The way he moved fluently like he had been working on these skills since the day he came out of the womb. Occasionally, he would let out a few grunts or mumble to himself, which Hagakure found strangely enduring of him. Kirishima and Jiro had taken the seats across from them, silently talking to themselves. Their chatter became white noise as they Bakugu, worked in peaceful silence. Eventually people started filtering into the commons to grab breakfast or finish homework from the previous day. But that was quickly dismissed when everyone grew captivated with the scene in front of them. Kirishima held a finger up to his mouth and winked, a sign not to mess with the master when he was working. So as more and more people woke, more and more people watched. The girls were freaking out. Momo, Mina whisper yelled, latching onto the other girl's arm, Momo, we just gotta invite him to the next girl's night. I, I don't see why not. She answered, flustered. When Midoriya and Ida got back from their morning runs, Midoriya smiled fondly at Bakugu as if he wasn't the biggest asshole to him. Oh, he bought his makeup kit to the dorms? I didn't think he did that. He mumbled to himself, stretching and sitting next to Kirishima. Finally, her face was completed. Bakugu grabbed her chin, not gently, and studied her face, as if looking for any tiny flaw. Hagakure decided that she didn't like it when he looked at her. Because Bakuga looked down at his watch, we got some fuckin's time, and that's good cuz, you still look like shit. Hagakure nodded along. Can you fucking put in contacts? Nope. Damn it. Fine I'll just fucking show you. You know how to put in contacts? Ojiro asked from the side. Bakugo looked up surprised, just realizing that three quarters of the class had been watching him for a good half hour. He huffed, I can't be fucking blind now can I? Yeah. Kirishima added his eyesight sucks ass. A makeup brush was thrown at him. Don't you extras have something better to do? Nope. Kaminari popped the pee, didn't know you were so good at makeup Baku bro. And wow, Hagakure, I can't see your eyes or hair yet but I may just have to ask you out. In your dreams, despite her harsh rejection, Hagakure blushed. No one had ever complimented her looks, at all. With much struggling they managed to get the colored contacts in her eyes. And that's where Hagakure got to see herself. She had chosen a fair tone, one like her mother's. The contacts were a pretty hazel color. All right fuckert Bakugu snapped her back to reality. Wig time, put your hair in a tight bun. She ended up choosing brown hair, which Bakugo styled to French braid. Wow, what couldn't he do? When she arrived back to the common rooms, everyone stood in awe. This was the first time they saw her, this was the first time she saw herself. She was just as overjoyed as them. Just as she was about to be swarmed by the girls, Bakugu turned her around by her shoulder. Hold the fuck up something's missing. She blinked. Hold still. He riddled through his bag to pull out eyeliner. She knew what to do, so she closed her eyes as he got it perfectly in one swipe. Really, screw him and his freakishly good makeup skills. He blew on her face to dry the newly added makeup. Out of the corner of her eye she noticed Kirishima looking on proudly. Bakugu let her go, looking strangely relaxed. It looks like doing a hobby like makeup could be a relaxing experience if someone was stressed. I won't do this every fucking time, but if you need me or whatever. Yeah, I know. And she did. That experience benefited both her and Bakugu. It eased Bakugu's worries, relaxing him. He didn't even have that crease between his brow anymore. And her, she got to be seen. Noticed. Of course there were things she could get away with, being invisible. But sometimes it was good just to be normal, after all, normal was all she wanted to be in life. When Hagakure and her parents looked back on the pictures of Picture Day, they held the many paper copies with shaky hands, tears falling onto the laminated cover. She was seen and it was wonderful. All thanks to Bakugu Katsuki. Mina wasn't stupid. She knew she looked different from the others, but unlike Shoji with his mutant quirk, she didn't care, her pink skin complemented her personality, made her stand out more. It wasn't hard for her to be spotted, she didn't need to be extra flashy. If Mina was a less sociable person, more insecure, then she would hate her quirk. 
She'd imagined Aizawa and Todoroki with her quirk a few times and almost threw up from laughing so hard. So yeah, her quirk felt specially made for just her. Like most other quirks, there were only a few other pink people on the, the planet, and that wasn't involving tattoos. Sure, it sucked that she couldn't wear makeup besides some eyeliner or mascara, and that her skin dried out easily from secreting acid. But the drawbacks could certainly be worse. At least she wasn't losing her hearing like Bakugu, though the poor dude wouldn't admit it just yet. And even though there were many diverse quirks in the world, some more deadly than others, quirk discrimination was still an important matter. Society has progressed since years ago where mutant quirk citizens were thrown into jail and mocked. She's just glad she didn't live back then, that sounded horrible. Even if it was a thing of the past, some mothers still covered their kids' eyes whenever she walked past. Some men still gave her intrigued looks. And no, they would certainly not be selling her on the black market if she had a say in it. Quirkism was the only history lesson she actually listened to. Gomina. So she never left to go anywhere alone. Something her parents taught her since preschool. But she was a teen and a part of the hero course. Being confident was her first mistake. Hey girls. Mina greeted as she entered the common rooms on a bright sunny Saturday. It was too perfect of a day not to do anything. It would be such a waste to sit inside. I'm going to the mall. Anyone coming with? A few hands shot up. Wow, Mina, you take your wardrobe seriously. Hagakure exclaimed, feeling along the fabric of Mina's leopard print tank top. Let me borrow your clothes sometime. Sure thing, ah, wait I can just give you some fashion advice when we get to the mall. You in? Heck yeah. Hagakure cheered, just wait, I gotta go get ready. Mina turned to the others lounging on the couch, anyone else coming? Ah, sorry I can't go. I have a study session with Midoriya and Ida later. Urarika flapped her hand sheepishly, maybe next weekend? I also cannot attend, my family had a business meeting. Momo answered. After their replies there were also a sting of dittos and other plans that were already made. Okay Mina shrugged, wow you're busy people, anyways we'll be back by. She looked at her watch, one o'clock. It was a new rule to tell people what time you would be back if you left the dorms during the weekend. Of course, Mina had already asked Aizawa sensei permission to leave, but it was just a security thing. In case something happened. No one wanted a repeat of the Kamino incident. It was a drag that no one else could join them, but at least Mina didn't have to go alone. Mina kept an eye on the time as they transferred from one shop to another. They both decided to go to the newly built mall, even if it was extremely crowded. It was worth it. Their clothes were truly extraordinary and including of people with mutant quirks. They passed a pair of pants as tall as Mina herself. Hagakure gawked at them as she pulled her along. It's rude to stare like that, you may make someone insecure. Oh Hagakure rubbed the back of her head sheepishly, or her sleeves moved that way. My bad. It's alright let's keep looking. For me, I stay away from all of the red shades, they look really bad with my skin. I'm sure it would look good on you though with that long sleeve white shirt of yours. But there's this one shade of magenta. Hagakure nodded along with the other's tips, grabbing stuff from the racks to carry to the dressing rooms. You would also look good with a black belt and, uh, uh, there it is. Mina mumbled, sliding a magenta colored sweater from a nearby rack. Mina continued to throw articles of clothes at Hagakure and kept some for herself to try on up until lunch. Hey, where do you want to go to eat? I don't know what they have here. Hagakure shrugged, not sure, I haven't been here either. The two muscled through the crowd, Hagakure scaring a few passerbys when she accidentally touched them. Oh there. Mina grabbed the other girl's arm, pointing to a nearby cafe. Yeah, looks good. Come on let's go eat, I'm starving. Mina's second mistake was going to the mall in general. But more specifically, it was letting Hagakure wait in the long line in the cafe while she was tasked to find a seat. Alone. The cafe, like the rest of the mall, was packed. The poor workers hustled around, taking orders and dropping food off at the same time. Mina cringed. She had a job as a waitress once to earn money for a new phone since she broke hers for the fifth time that year. But quickly lost it. It was incredibly hard to get the groove of things, especially when she worked the rush hour. A rough elbow to her shoulder pushed her out of balance, sending her tumbling and almost falling to the ground. 
She caught herself before she made a scene. Hey Dash. She turned around to face whoever had ran into her. She wasn't on the defense yet, since it obviously could have been an accident. But that thought vanished when she saw the man's face. He snickered down at her. A grown-ass man was laughing at a teenage girl for falling. Mina growled, you're pretty fucked up. The man seemed considerably calm, only pushing his glasses up on his face. He had no visible quirk, just that annoying smug look on his face. Then the words left his mouth. You should cover up that hideous pink skin of yours, it's in my way. Maybe you should chop off those horns and sell them, you'll make a living off of them, assuming you aren't ever going to be able to get a job with that ghastly appearance of yours. An unfiltered rage flared up in Mina's gut as she shot to her feet, getting into the man's face. It's pretty fucking puny of you to pick on a teenage girl like that. She pointed a finger to the man's chest, covered in a polished sweet. Of course he was rich. The man only chuckled, still remaining collected. They were earning side glances but no outright stares just yet. I have a right to state what is on my mind. And you, are not even a teenage girl you're a mutant? Mina bared her teeth, her dentist was going to throw a fit with how much she was grinding them. Just before she could open her mouth to verbally rip the polished fancy pants a new one, he put a bony finger up. Ah, it seems the line is moving. The stick of a man reached into his breast pocket to pull out a card and hand it to her. Think about it. He moved with the flow of the people, leaving Mina to look down at the card, showcasing a picture of the man smiling. It wasn't a warm smile. Across the top the business card read, Body Modification. She crumbled it with shaky fist, coming down from her adrenaline high. Mina felt the urge to scream and cry. To throw the offending paper to the floor and stomp on it. But she only shoved it into her jacket pocket. She would burn it later in the 1A dorm's fireplace. Mina found a place near the back of the cafe. It was a bit more closed off, with only one other booth behind it. Perfect. When she sat her bags down on the floor, she caught a familiar puff of ash blonde hair in the other booth. She knew all too well who it was, but she wasn't in the mood to bug him right now. Mina huffed. She absolutely refused to cry. She was tougher than that. She had thick, pink skin. And she liked it. There was no reason to listen to this skinny, entitled rich man. Something wet landed on her face. Before Mina could even take a second to wipe it off, a raw scream ripped itself from her throat. She stood from the booth, bags of clothes forgotten. Mina saw red as she furiously wiped the spit away from her face. The residences of the cafe all jolted in in shock, looking between Mina and the other teenage boy. Why, she pointed with a clenched fist. Fuck you. Really fuck you. The offending man was not the same one who gave her the card. No, the skinny man wouldn't dare to waste his spit on her. He had to go above and beyond just to get under Mina's skin and pay some random teen. To his credit, even though he looked terrified, the teenager opened his mouth to talk. But that's what you get for looking so freakish. Maybe you should stay inside for the rest of your life. Or better yet Dash, the teen shot a glance to the skinny rich dude, who nodded. Just jump off of a Dash. Shut. A rough, familiar voice cut in. And damn, Bakugu sounded pissed. Or I'll make you. He stalked to Mina, who didn't realize she was shaking in rage or fear until he grabbed her arm and pushed a napkin against it. Wipe that shit off your face. Mina numbly followed his orders. Out of the corner of her eyes, she noticed the skinny prick make a waving gesture. He wasn't done. The teen looked unsure, but continued. Just jump off a roof to give us the relief of never having to see that abnormal face of yours. Or get it fixed dash. Bakugu moved like a whip. He was so fast that even Mina's eyes couldn't track him. One second the teen was dishing out insults, and the next he was on the floor, taking a table with him when he fell. Bakugu stood over him, shoulders tense and fighting posture ready. He was ready to fight anyone else who was willing to give back talk. Something bloomed in Mina's chest amongst her cyclone of current feelings. Bakugu had helped her. He had taken down some random extra in order for her to keep her honor. Mina had heard from her classmates that Bakugu had been helping them, and she believed it. Mina didn't have any more time to ponder, eyes were still on her, and now Bakugu. Some customers and workers looked terrified of them. 
something Mina never wanted to see again, people looking at her with fear. It was terrible, almost worse than the insults thrown at her. Bakugu turned to her, face twisted in anger. If Kirishima was here, he would be squealing with how annoyingly smoke and hot Bakugu looked in that moment. Bubblegum dash, he winced, Mina? Come on. Bwa. He was being considerate. Let's blow this place. Mina's eyebrows rose up to her hairline. No, not Akyum. Just come the fuck on. Bakugu ran a hand through his hair in a frustrated manner as he lead her out of the cafe. Multiple pairs of eyes drilled into Mina's back. Now that they were outside, Mina's mind cleared. Wait, we left Hagakure Dash. Tisich Invisibich can take care of herself. Don't you have her fucking number anyways? Oh yeah, she did. Hey, what are you doing here anyways? None of your fucking business. Mina gave him a look. She still felt on edge but mostly calmed down. They rounded one of the mall's many corners. My mom likes to meet during the weekends. Bakuga's mumble answer was almost inaudible in the booming loudness of the crowd. Let's get the hell out of here it's too packed. Wow, he seemed to have read her mind. Mina's phone vibrated in her pocket as her and Bakugu sat down at yet another cafe. One that was less populated. So you're a mama's boy, huh? Mina smirked as she slipped her phone out. Wait, what is she gonna say when you're not there to meet her? Bakugu shrugged, I dunno, the haggle probably yell. Mina chose not to acknowledge that he called his own mother hag. There were more surprising things in life, like how he decided to help her. Hey, uh. Thanks for the help back there, Blasty. You really got me out of a tough spot? He shrugged again. They were being loud as fuck. Their insults could have been at least creative. Fuck munches. Mina huffed out a small laugh. Yeah, I've been called worse. He could have at least been original. Bakugu eyed Mina, his crimson gaze studying her. She shifted in her chair. People always got shit to Sage. He finally said they can take their opinions and shove it up their asses. Mina agreed 100%. Well, still that was Bada Dash, Mina's phone started ringing in her hands. She looked down to see Hagakure's contact photo. Answer her, Bakugu supplied, she probably has no fucking idea what happened. The moment Mina clicked the green answer button, Hagakure's worried voice flooded from the speakers. Mina! Oh my god, you answered. Are you okay? Is Bakugu okay? Oh man, he curb stomped that dude, it was so awesome. And that dude totally deserved it for saying those awful things. And oh my god, you're okay, right, Dash? Mina cleared her throat, yeah, I'm okay. Bakugu snorted, dumbest that wasn't even a curb stomp. Anyways, I'm glad you picked up because the police are looking for you. Hagakure said, ignoring Bakugu's correction. They're what now? Fuck, Bakugu cursed, we can't just run from the fucking cops. Agreed, Mina nodded, Hagakure, what are they doing now? Well, the teen is playing the innocent act, and since you're not here to defend yourselves, shit, Bakugu cursed again. Before they could even formulate a plan, probably to turn themselves in peacefully because if Mina knew anything about Bakugu, it was that he was the most unwilling to get in trouble with the law. It may seem like he was the most possible student too, but he was a stickler to the rules despite his brash demeanor. A duo of cops entered the cafe. Well, they were certainly fucked now. The second Mina saw the officers' faces, eyebrows lowered and teeth bared, she knew it wasn't going to end well. One of the officers, the short fat one huh, how stereotypical, scanned the room with his beady laser eyes. Once they landed on Mina, it was hard to miss with her bright appearance, he tapped on the other man. Bakuga Dash. I know. Mina hummed, looking anywhere but the approaching officers. There's nothing we can do. The best we can do is tell them our stories. Bakugu concluded, hands clamped together on the table in front of him. Mina didn't know if it was an attempt to keep his sweat from igniting or a sign of surrender. Defeat. Mina knew Bakugu hated those words. He wouldn't even utter them. But there was a gleam in his eyes that told her otherwise. He had something in mind. Guys? You okay? Hagakure's voice cracked over the speaker. Invisibitch, I need you to listen closely. Okay? Stay at the cafe. A woman who looks annoyingly similar to me will be there soon. I need you to tell her what happened and you two go get fucking Aizawa. And yeah, that was a brilliant plan. Does this woman happen to have blonde spiky hair and carry around a purse like she's ready to beat someone with it? That'll be her. Just as she hung up, 
The two men made it to their table. Yes, officers? Mina asked, batting her eyes innocently. They simply looked down to her, then Bakugu, who met their gaze fiercely. We need you two to take a step out of the booth calmly, put your hands up. Her and Bakugu both blinked in surprise, looking to each other. Sure they expected the officers to be weary of them but did they really need to be manhandled? After a beat of silence the cops inches closer. We said get up. No looking at each other or talking. The short stubby one side eyed Bakugu. And no funny business. By now the residents of the cafe had cleared out of the way, some recording the scene while other mothers covered their children's eyes. Man, Mina was really staring to hate cafes. Officer Mina started, would you let us explain our situation? We aren't dangerous so there's no need for handcuffs dash. Cop number two let out a big belly laugh, sure you're not, blondie here. He grabbed Bakugu by his poofy hair and jerked it roughly. Straight up flattened a kid. Bakugu kept his cool, surprisingly, though winced at the man's tough treatment. Please let go of his hair Mina pleaded through gritted teeth. The man's beefy hand only clenched tighter around ash blonde strands in a vice grip. I will when you get up and put your hands up. Excuse me? Mina quirked an eyebrow, but Kugu looked about ready to blow the officer into next week. Mina turned to the shocked crowd, is this even allowed? A few onlookers shook their heads, but none intervened. Just get up and come peacefully and we'll hear you out. Shorty grunted hands on his belt as if it was too tight around his gut. It probably was. Mina traded another glance to Bakugu, who couldn't even nod. But she understood. If they didn't follow orders, no matter how unreasonable, it would only cause more issues. Slowly Mina scooted out of her side of the booth, hands up. Bakugu didn't even get the chance to get up for himself, the other officer simply dragged him up by the hair. Let go of him, he can do it by himself. Shut up Pinky the officer putting cuffs on her said. We can rough em up just fine. He ruthlessly beat another kid in public. Bakugu growled like some kind of rabid dog as he was pushed around. Mina spotted small pinprick of tears in the corner of his eyes. It wasn't in humiliation, because the situation wasn't as embarrassing as Mina had thought it would be. The officer was simply tugging his hair so much that it was beginning to hurt. Mina hated that all she could do was grin and bear it. She couldn't even imagine how Bakugu must have been feeling. They were lead down the passageways of the mall, more than a few people giving them curious once-overs before continuing on with their winter shopping. When Mina imagined a ride in the police car, it definitely didn't involve her and a livid Bakugu being thrown into the back of it. It was more of her in the driver's seat performing street-staining donuts. Whatever, that was a fantasy she could do in the future. It also sucked that her and Bakugu couldn't even talk to each other. A mind-reading quirk would have come in handy in their situation. She was desperate to know the other's thought process. Bakugu looked strangely distressed. Of course he just got a brain-pulling scalp removal, but the look on his face was strange. Then she noticed him flexing against the handcuffs. Of course. Mina knew Bakugu had a thing with his hands being re-trained ever since the League of Villains incident and the sports festival. Oh wow, this could be bad. It seemed that that sentence was now the mantra of the day. The police's walkie-talkies crackled to life, taking the cops' attention. But Kugushi murmured, are you doing okay? Can you make it to the station? He nodded shakily. It was uncertain but there was nothing Mina could do, even if he was lying. She wished Kirishima was here. Their phones were confiscated, along with Bakugu's hearing aids, which was pretty shitty. She was glad he knew how to read lips, even if he could still hear her well enough, it was a good skill to have. She tapped his shoe with her fuzzy boot. It was a reminder that she was there, an anchor to ground him. The ride was long and suffering, Bakugu's breaths coming out in short, uneasy puffs the whole time. His eyes were glassy and unseeing. Another thing to add to the list of things Mina never wanted to see again. It was adding up. When they arrived at the station, they were separated and pulled into different rooms. The room was smaller than she suspected it would be. Shouldn't these people be questioning like, serial murders? Why waste their time on a few teens who got into a fist fight? They should have just let them wait for their parents to pick them up. It seemed much more reasonable. Pushing through her rapidly growing irritation, Mina recounted the events of the day. 
This officer, a new one, was a female and seemed much more understanding. I'm sorry for the rough treatment she rolled her eyes, those two need to be demoted, their promotion put them on a high horse. Mina just knew what Bakuga would say if he were here, so she said it for him. Well they can take their high horses and shove it up their asses? The woman nodded, a small smirk on her face. She flipped through a few papers. I'm sorry this all happened to you, unfortunately we need to place you in a cell until your guardians can come. But we have popcorn if you want some? And yeah, this sheepalise was much more chill than dumb and dumber. When Mina arrived at the cell, Bakugu was already there, in the one next to hers. You okay? She asked. He didn't seem to hear her, his face turned downward. Mina stomped to get his attention. His head jolted up. Hey, she waved. You get your hearing aids back? He shook his head. When the sheepalise arrived with popcorn, handing a bag to her and another one to Bakugu, she asked her for his hearing aids. They took them away from him? They both nodded. She growled, stomping off, hopefully to punch the two pricks right in their ugly faces. Once they both settled down, Mina popped a popcorn kernel in her mouth. So how'd questioning go? Nothing special, just told him what happened. Same here. This is pretty stupid. They sat in silence for a long moment before a question slipped past her unfiltered mouth. Do you regret it? Regret what? You know, Mina flung her fist into the air in a lazy punching motion. Giving that dude the ol' one-two. Bakuga looked perplexed. It was almost funny. One-two, no raccoon eyes, he deserved it. Huh, guess so. It was Bakugu's turn to ask a question. What exactly happened? I didn't catch the whole story when we were being thrown into the fuckin's police car. For the second time Mina explained the story. You saying that someone paid that shithead to say it? Uh huh. Mina was hanging upside down at this point, throwing popcorn into the air and catching it between her teeth. Bakugu stopped his fidgeting, closing his eyes to think. Mina didn't retract her gaze when he opened his eyes. Give me the card. The wa. The fucking business card the fuckwed gave you. Hand it over. It's in my boot. Bakugu gave her a deadpan glare. Why? I dunno, just felt like putting it there, it felt cool. Like I was a special agent. She reached down into her boot to slip the card out. Bakugu reached between the bars separating them and snatched the card, snarling. That slimy no good fuckwed. He looked possibly the most outraged that Mina had ever seen him. More colorful curses that would make a sailor blush escaped past his lips as he paced his cell. Whoa calm down Bakugu, what's the deal? That bastard targets people with mutant quirks and brings them down in hopes that he'll get more business. He performs quirk surgeries to remove or modify them. Mina's eyes widened, her pink skin glowing in deep magenta shade. Oh shit. It made perfect sense. She wished it didn't. Bakugu was spot on with his analyzation. He's going to fucking jail for this when I'm through with Dash. Wait, we can lock him up? Bakugu stopped his pacing, looking much like a caged animal. Yeah, fuck him. It's like, it's like suicide baiting. It's not as extreme but ending a part of you, your quirk. He clenched his fist. He seemed strangely somber in that moment, guilt flashed in those sharp eyes of his. It's the most extreme form of stupid-ass bullying. Hugs was all Mina could manage. She could never imagine trying to change her quirk ever. She loved it, even if it seemed unconventional at times, it was what made her Mina a Shido. She was used to the rude comments, can't you just peel off your skin? Get fucking contacts that's creepy as fuck, just saw off those horns they're bothering me. But that was whatever. Thankfully they didn't have to remain in the cell for much longer. A good twenty minutes after their conversation their backup arrived. Aizawa was the first to enter the room, calm and collected as always. Though there was something dangerous lingering in his eyes. He was mad Mina could feel it. Aizawa sensei. She cried, coming up to stick her face between the bars. I heard what happened, I'm sorry. His lip was curled in distaste as he unlocked her cell. It's okay. Me and Bakugu cracked a puzzle like the detectives we are. Mina announced, finger pointed at a napping Bakugu. He must have been exhausted from absolutely kicking that teen into the next dimension. Well you can tell us when we get into the car. Your UA's problems now. Mina had no idea when Kirishima and Hagakure had snuck up behind Aizawa. 
Kirishima unlocked Bakugu's cell, gently shaking him awake. Bakugu grunted, rising from the bench and rubbing his eyes. Kirishima slipped on his hearing aids for him and gosh, they were so cute that Mina wanted to throw up. That was crazy. Hagakure shouted once Mina was free from her prison. Mrs. Bakugu is yelling at the policemen, oh you should see it it's great. Oh, and your video is viral on the internet. My what dash? Yeah. Hagakure held out her phone, look, some bystanders got a video of you and Bakugu getting arrested. Kirishima flipped the hell out when he saw it. Can you blame me? The reed head asked as they climbed into the van. They were basically hurting him. That's not right. Bakugu slapped Kirishima's probing hand away when he tried to brush it through his hair, looking for non-existent damage. I'm fucking fine, eh? T wasn't that bad. Yeah, but still Kirishima pouted, it shouldn't have happened in the first place. And Mina, are you okay? Oh, I'm good. Man, you should have seen Bakugu fight off my bully. Kira, you would have been swooning. Oh no, I did see it, that's also trending. It was hot. Hagakure cut in from her place next to Mina, what do you mean just hot? Kirishima, you almost passed out. Hagakure, I swear to God, dash. Their conversation died down when Aizawa started questioning them. The story was getting old by the third time Mina explained it. Aizawa hummed thoughtfully, eyes on the road. You know Bakugu is right, we could possibly sue this man. Mina turned back to Bakugu, who was already smirking. Let's fucking do it. Mina learned a surprising amount about Bakugu that day. Through that experience alone they gained a mutual respect for each other. Mina was ecstatic when Bakugu started accompanying her on her mall trips. And even more so when she got to meet his parents, her favorite clothing designer and model. But yeah, besides the shitty cop, the annoying man and teenager, and the fact that she never got to do a donut in the cop car, it was a pretty okay day. Kaminari did not have the best control over his quirk and it wasn't a secret. It had so many stupid drawbacks that sometimes it made him want to cry in frustration and give up everything he had been working so hard for. The electricity coursing through his veins was stupid and kept him up all night. It made him twitch uncontrollably and fidget during class. And worse of all, it made him brain dead after exceeding his limits. It made him look stupid and useless. What he didn't tell anyone, though, was that it was painful. It hurt a lot when he used his quirk, and even worse when he went to way mode. His limbs grew stiff, twitching occasionally, his mind fried. He could hear and feel anything happening around him, but he lacked the proper motor function and vision. But sometimes the words aimed towards him when he went into dumb mode hurt worse than the stinging sensation. Though Kaminari wouldn't be telling anyone about that anytime soon, he was meant to be the comedy relief of the group. Meant to make people laugh instead of worry. Contrary to popular belief, Kaminari wasn't stupid. He knew that if he was in one of those shounen animes, then he would be the funny side character. Nothing more. He wasn't a cool person and definitely wasn't main character material like Midoriya or Bakugu. Little did Kaminari know is that his carefully crafted mask would soon be torn down. Well, torn down was a harsh way to put it. Kaminari and his friends usually had a system when it came to group missions. Some way or another, Kaminari would always end up zapped out. And when that time did come, he pushed through the pain and let Jiro, Mina, Siro, or Kirishima lead him around. He never missed the snickers and remarks by his less thoughtful classmates. He almost wished he did. This exercise wasn't supposed to be any different. But somehow it was. This is a partner training course, Aizawa-sensei explained, already zipping up his yellow sleeping bag. Kaminari's favorite color. It works as an obstacle course, but since nothing's ever easy in this school, there will be training bots placed in between each obstacle. The class all cheered in delight. It had been a while since they had been able to do anything hands-on. They had been doing those stupid tests the week before. Heck yeah. Kirishima bumped his fists together. Some real training. Bakugu smirked from beside him. We're gonna beat this shitty course. Actually, Zawa interrupted. Pairs will be randomized. Kirishima's shoulders slumped slightly, looking much like a kicked puppy. Kaminari elbowed him. Hey, cheer up, bro. You may end up with me. Wrong on that account, too? Aizawa smirked. Kaminari, you're with Bakugu. Well, Aizawa really wanted to see Kaminari suffer, huh? 
Bakugu turned to him while the other pairs were being listed. Okay Pikachu, let's do this shit and leave no one alive. Why yet? Kaminari nodded numbly, eye twitching. Not sure we should necessarily kill anyone but, pop off I guess. The course was one of those long-winded ones created for stamina. Kaminari hated those, but Bakugu never wavered as he started plowing through it. It turned out, though, that Kaminari was even more helpful than he thought he would be. He and Bakugu made a good dynamic duo if Kaminari did say so himself. Denki could sense the training bots before they even passed the obstacle, telling Bakugu exactly where they were located so he could go all crazy Pomeranian on them. It was fun to watch. As they came up on the insanely large wall, Bakugu turned back to him with one of those maniacal grins. Kaminari had no idea how Kurishima liked this crazy dude, but he wasn't one to judge. Hey, spark plug, wanna fry a few? Was, was Bakugu offering to share his victims with him? It would be rude to deny such a generous proposal. So he nodded, readjusting the antenna on his head. There was a huge surge of electrical activity on the other side of the wall, but he could take them down with his indiscriminate shock. All right, Baku bro, let's do this. Without warning, Bakugu put a hand against the wall, his palms glowing before the deafening explosion was produced. As expected, the wall was in shambles by the time the smoke cleared, and as expected, there were an insane amount of bots on the other side. Get M. Dunn's face. And he did. Kaminari produced all of the electricity thrumming through his veins, focusing the power to the tips of his fingers and letting it loose. Though he vastly underestimated the amount of energy he would expend taking all of them down, especially since it took more for him to fry electronics, considering they ran on electricity themselves. But he did the job. He felt proud even when his limbs started to numb and a blinding pain started to bloom behind his eyes. He couldn't do much more in his current state, but it was the end of the course anyways. Good job, dummy, Bakuga grumbled, and he felt him grab his hand and lead him forwards. Now let's fucking go. If Kaminari's tear ducts could work at the moment, he would start crying at the praise. No one had really said nice stuff like that when he was in zapped out mode besides his close friends. And wow, him and Bakugu were going to become close friends, weren't they? There was no denying it now. Then, the sharp pain in his head moved down to his body, stray electricity jolted him. Ow, 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 Dunn's face? Kaminari heard Bakugu ask. They continued on their pace, but if Kaminari could make a guess then he would think that Bakugu was looking back at him. Are you in fucking pain? What the fuck? How the heck did he pick up on that? He thought he didn't convey any emotion on the outside when he was zapped out? He opened his mouth to try to speak, but all that came out was a garbled noise. Gross. Th hold on. Bakugu stopped and wiped fabric across his face, probably to wipe away the drool. Then they proceeded. For some strange reason, Kaminari liked letting Bakugu lead him around. He was very vocal with what they were doing, and Kaminari had no idea if it was on purpose as a way to help him or if it was what he naturally did. Either way, he was still shocked, eh? He get it, that Bakugu picked up on his pain. By now it subsided to a dull thrum, but it was still painful. It looks like he had found a new leading buddy. Wow. That training exercise really took a lot out of me. Kirishima sat down on the common room couch. Busting through all of those walls wasn't easy. For someone so exhausted, you sure are fucking energetic? Bakugu grumbled, sitting down by his side, setting a book down in his lap. Kirishima grinned, putting an arm around Katsuki's shoulder. And for such a brash manly dude, you sure do read a lot. Bakugu blushed furiously, slamming his book closed. Shut the fuck up, he spat. This is a good fucking book? Kirishima chuckled, allowing the blonde to lean closer and reopen his book. Ugh, someone groaned from the doorway. Y'all two are so cute together that it makes me want to barf. Kaminari commented as he walked past the couch to get to the boy's side of the dorms. You're just jealous, bro. Kirishima called over his shoulder, looking back down to see a contemplative look on Bakugu's face. Babe? Everything okay in that head of yours? Fine, Bakugu grumbled, sparing another glance down the hall where Kaminari had disappeared down. K they sat in compatible silence for a minute before Bakugu spoke up again. Just as Ijiro knew he would. I you know when Dunt's face goes into. Way mode. Ugh, yeah of course I do. D 
does he ever say fucking anything about it? Kirishima frowned, turning his head so he could face Katsuki. No, not really? Bakuga looked up to meet his gaze, there's something he's not fucking telling us, and I wanna know. Wait, I'm confused, something about his way mode? Bakugu's fist tightened around his book, creasing its pages. Kirishima plucked it from his grasp so he wouldn't accidentally blow it up like he had his last book. He's just, he's just way too fucking happy. His happiness bothers you? Fuck no, Bakugu sniffed, it's not that. I can just tell it's fucking fake. When he goes into that stupid way mode, I can tell he's hurting or whatever. Kirishima squeezed Bakugu's shoulder, pulling him closer. It was worrying to think that Denki could be hiding his true feelings and pain from them. But at the same time, his eyes glittered. Cat, are you worried? Do you know I'm fucking not? Kirishima smirked, ruffling his hair until Bakugu gently slapped his hand away. Yes, you totally are. Then he turned back to serious mode. But seriously, why? I'm not saying you're incapable of feelings or whatever, it's just that you usually don't pay much attention to others' feelings. Bakuga growled, huh? The fuck? Of course I fucking do. Kirishima gave him a stern look. Maybe. Look, it's just... He held out his bald fist. You think it's easy being a fucking walking bomb? Sweating a toxic substance? Huh. My hearing is going away and... And every single shitty time I make an explosion, the recoil hurts the fuck out of my shoulders. Sometimes it's hard to even hold up a fucking pencil because of the tension build up in my arms. Kirishima knew this all too well, he was the one who massaged the tension from Bakuga's arms, so he let him rant. It was sad that he had such a bad cork drawback that he would eventually lose the ability to hear, but that wouldn't stop Kirishima's affection. And if Dunt's face is like me, then he's a tough bastard. Kirishima knew the Bakuga language. His boyfriend didn't want Kaminari to suffer like him. How manly of him. You gonna talk to him about it? Bakugu shrugged. I just fucking might. Kirishima handed him his book back, letting Katsuki lean back against him. Great, now no more worrying, time to relax. If your arms get tense again then tell me so I can help. Bakugu hummed, opening the page up to his bookmark. There was another partner training exercise within the same week, surprisingly. They didn't do them too much but Kaminari guessed that Aizawa-sensei wanted the others to learn to be more collaborative and build teamwork skills. He was a pretty social dude, so Kaminari had no issue with the modified training regimen. When Aizawa announced they could choose their own partners for the stealth exercise, Kaminari turned towards Siro with a smirk. Then, Bakugu roughly grabbed him by the shoulder. You're partnering with me Dunn's face. Bakugo wasn't the best person to be with for a stealth mission given how loud he tended to be, but Kaminari wasn't about to complain. Even if he was confused, Bakugo was a top student and he wanted to partner with the bottom one? And where was Kirishima anyways? Well, Pikachu? Oh yeah, let's do this. Siro shot him a quizzical look from across the room, and all Kaminari could do was shrug as he was dragged off to the training setup. The mission wasn't too complicated. Bakugu and Kaminari passed with ease just as they did the last time they worked together. Kaminari only fried himself out towards the end of the exercise this time. Bakugu, also the same as last time, led him around. After a long while of standing still and enduring the pain, Aizawa sensei's monotone voice was heard, critiquing the groups and disbanding them. Voices chattered around Kaminari's head as he was led, still by Bakugu, to where he would guess was the locker room. Bakugu was really a big soft, wasn't he? Kaminari knew his secret. He was sat down on a bench. Or he hoped it was a bench. We're in the locker room, Pikachu, Bakugu informed, pulling away, probably to change back into his school clothes. Kaminari allowed the feeling to return to his limbs and replace the achy pain. It wasn't strange for him to return to his normal state. Aizawa even gave him a pass to be late to the next class. When his vision finally returned, the locker room was empty. Well, almost empty. Bakugu sat on the bench across from him, staring at him intently. Kaminari blinked, a small confused noise escaping past his lips. Dude? He asked, his voice cracked as he backpedaled. Are you some kind of stalker? What's up? Why are you here and staring at me? Do I have drool on my face? Bakugu snorted, leaning back against the lockers. No, well, yes. You do have fucking drool on your face, but no, 
I'm not a shitty stalker. Denki wiped his face free of any saliva. Well yeah, I would hope not. But why are you here? He repeated. I had a fucking question. Shoot. Kaminari struggled to put in his locker combo for a solid minute, his fingers still shaky with pain. Why the fuck do you lie? Why do you act the way you do? Bakugu narrowed his eyes at him, and Kaminari felt as if he was looking directly through all of his deception. Kaminari slid his arms through the shirt sleeves, starting on the buttons and struggling with them. I dunno what you mean. Bakugu stood stiffly, and Kaminari could practically hear his teeth grinding together. Geez, he really felt bad for the dude's dentist. The fuck you don't? Kaminari didn't know how Katsuki Bakugu, of all people, figured him out. Those sharp eyes of his saw right through his funny guy act. Sure, he was naturally funny, just, he used it to hide the pain. It was an unhealthy coping mechanism, he knew, but what else was there for him to do? Baku bro, are you sure you didn't hit your head out on the field? Enough. Bakuga barked, slamming his fist against the locker, the booming sound echoing through the locker room. Just dash when he looked up, Kaminari could see that look on his face. He wore it himself sometimes. Fucking tell me. I, I understand more than you think. Kaminari stopped attempting to get his last few buttons, instead studying Bakugu. Was he, the most explosive careless Kaminari had ever met, trying to be nice? You serious about this? This of fucking course I am. So spill or we're sitting here for the rest of the day. So Kaminari did. The words flowed past his lips before he could stop them. Feelings he had desperately hidden finally revealed. He vented to the one person he never expected to confide in. Ever. His cork was shitty. It hurt like hell. People laughed at him and it messed him up more than he let on. He is the comedy relief. He was the lowest ranking on pretty much everything in their class. It was hard. And Bakugu listened, never interrupting, only humming when Kamianri trailed off. And by the end of his ramble, Denki had tears trailing down his cheeks. He rubbed them away in embarrassment. While wow, Bakugu snorted, but it wasn't in a mean way. You had a lot of shit on your chest. Feel nice now that it's out in the open? Kaminari nodded. It truly did. What about you? You said you understood me? Yeah, but we'll talk about that later. We have to get to fucking class. Bakugu stood, hefting his school bag over one shoulder. Hey, Bakugu. The blonde stopped at the doorway, tilting his head back. Ha. Huh. Thanks, I needed that. Whatever, you can talk to me whenever the fuck you want to. You have shitty problems? He exited the room, that air of confidence surrounding him like it always did. And yeah, Kaminari had made a new friend. Jiro wasn't much like her other classmates. Most of them, she knew, had been aspiring to be heroes at a freakishly young age. She figured it was most people's dreams, being able to shine in the public's eye and save lives, even if it was ranked one of the hardest occupations in Japan. But Jiro wanted to shine in a different way, up on a stage doing what she did best. While her other classmates had their strong passions of being the greatest heroes, Bakugu being a prime example, she focused on what she herself was passionate about. Studying her music and performing it. It was a hard choice attending UA when she had a perfect opportunity to go to a performing arts school for her music. Like the others, she wanted to spread her message to help people. Music had crazy ways of helping people, though there was always a lingering fear that she would fail. Her one dream to spread her message would be crushed if she wasn't good enough in the fiercely talented music industry, so she formulated a plan. In hero work, you could also change people's lives. You can save them. And now that Jiro was in school to become a hero, more options were opening themselves up to her. So she works on music as a side study while working to be the best hero she could be. It wasn't impossible, heck. She knew a few heroes who performed music on the side. In fact, one of them happened to be her teacher, who was standing in front of her at the moment, presenting her with a golden opportunity so generous that her jaw was on the floor. Don't catch flies, kid. I'll give you time to think about it, yeah? Present Mike chuckled, kicking his legs up on the teaching podium, his rolling chair creaking with effort. If Aizawa was here he would kick him out of the room for sitting like a child. Jiro quickly regained her composure, her mouth closing with the clack of her teeth. Present Mike, one of the most popular hero pop stars, 
was inviting Jiro and her band to open at his next concert. Her eyes almost watered just imagining the immense amount of people that would get to hear her sing to spread her message. She had to look behind herself in the empty classroom just to make sure he was actually talking to her. You, you're serious? The teacher nodded his head, a smug smile on his face. This, this is a crazy opportunity. I'll do it. J.S. let me get the music together and dash. Present Mike leaned back in his chair. It looked dangerously close to toppling over, but somehow it stayed upright. No need to panic, little listener. I always have at least one student who is as emotionally attached to music as I am. He dramatically pulled a blonde strand of hair behind his ear. I'll throw out a bone for you to help kickstart your career. You got a promising talent? Jiro bent low into a bow. Thank you, Mike Sensei. I won't let you down, I promise. The blonde hero waved her off, I know. Now go do that English homework I assigned you and let me know what you're going to be playing. Of course. As Jiro left to trek back to the dorms and bask in victory when she announced the great news, she figured she would never turn in a late assignment ever again. Well, for English. She didn't see Aizawa Sensei dishing out any record deals. Jiro's band members were composed of Kaminari, who volunteered to join when their bassist dropped out. Yosetsu Aways and Manga Fukudashi from Class 1B also joined soon after Class 1 as performance for the festival. Manga didn't play an instrument, but gladly helped with the lyric writing process and displayed the lyrics with his quirk for the crowd to see. It was a huge hit to have the words out for everyone to see, apparently. Shinso and a few of Jiro's other middle school friends manned the other instruments, all in all they were a solid band. They performed occasional gigs at small places, but never before have they done a concert. The class enthusiastically congratulated her when she arrived back to the dorms. Kaminari was practically bouncing off the walls at the good news. Together they sifted through their top songs, creating a book of their potential music choices. They worked so late into the night that when Aizawa went on his nightly rounds, he kicked them from the common room couches, escorting them to their room with a blank face. The next day Jiro and Kaminari stomped up to the teacher's lounge proudly, the song spread in hand, and presented it to present Mike. He scanned the pages and time limits, nodding in satisfaction. Perfect time slot. It'll work out. Mm. What's up? Midnight asked, curiously poking her head from behind her computer. I got an opening band to perform for my show is What's Up. Present Mike flapped the paper in her face. Oh, I'll be sure to invite the staff then. It'll be fun. Kaminari and Jiro watched the interaction with flushed faces. Not only would both Class 1A and 1B be attending, but the school staff. It was overwhelming. Present Mike shuffled around in his chair, plucking a pen from a nearby pencil cup and jotting down a few notes before handing the paper back off to Kaminari. You got a month before the big show, rehearse hard little listeners. Yes, sir. Kaminari. The dunce actually saluted. Jiro dragged him out of there, embarrassed on his behalf. As the days passed quickly, they practiced non-stop every day or, from what Bakugu could tell, they were. It was getting fucking annoying, the concert was all the idiots chattered about during their free time. Even when he was with Kurishima, the person he trusted the most in the fucking world, it was discussed. About a week before the show, when Kurishima asked if he was going to the concert, Bokogu felt completely and utterly betrayed. Shut the fuck up, he mumbled, glaring up from where he was chopping the onion. Whoever cried while chopping these abominations needed to see a fucking therapist for being such pussies. I don't be mean, I was just asking if you wanted to go see it with me. Kirishima pouted, wrapping his arms around Bokogu's shoulders and slumping. Like a fucking date? No cat, I just want to go hang out in a completely platonic way. Kirishima stated, sarcasm laced in his tone. Really fucking smart of you to patronize me when I have a knife, Ijiro. Kirishima scooted away cautiously, okay, but... Do you want to? What? Go to the shitty concert? Yes. Bakugu carefully put his knife down onto the cutting board, twisting around to face his boyfriend with an exasperated sigh. If you really want to go then yes, I'll fucking tolerate the other extras. Uh. Kirishima gushed pulling Katsuki into a hug, the things you do for me, I love you. Yeah yeah, now get the hell off of me. Bakugo grumbled, pushing his hand against Kirishima's face when he refused to let go. Oh, 
Onion hands. That's what you get, fucker. Now move, let me wash my hands. One week until showtime quickly turned into a few days, and Jiro was starting to lose her shit. She knew they had their songs well rehearsed and memorized, but as any true musician felt before a show, she was never prepared enough. A swell of anxiety bubbled in her stomach. She could practically feel that something terrible was going to happen. Then the days blew by in the blink of an eye, and now she was sitting in front of her mirror backstage, hours before the concert, her nerves had only increased since then. Her band members and present mics were filtering into the other seats. She had time to converse with present mix band and quickly realized they were much like him. Easygoing and collected, even if they horse played much like the teenagers in her band did, she could tell they were a singular unit and worked as a well-oiled machine. What's cracking Jiro? Kaminari shouted directly in her ear, making her jolt in surprise her ear jack poking him in the ribs. Oh, that hurt. Good, don't yell in my ear. Kaminari arrived significantly later than everyone else. Apparently he had to carpool with poor Bakugu and Kirishima. We're on in an hour, how do you feel? An hour? Had Jiro really been thinking for that long? Fine. Kaminari frowned, pulling up a chair to sit next to her instead of crouching. You look sick. You're even twirling with your ear jacks like you do when you're nervous? Jiro grit her teeth, hands dropping from her ears. Shut up. She ignored the blonde as she bent down to riffle in her makeup bag for the eyeliner she had yet to apply. She angled the liquid eyeliner stick to her right eye, quickly realizing that her hands were far too shaky to make a straight line. She scanned the rest of the room, they were all similarly preparing for the show. Shinso was busy working on his own makeup. Manga and Yosetsu weren't big on makeup, but Tendu was helping them out. They were all occupied. Ugh, Kaminari? Mm. Can you grab Bakugu and tell him to get his ass in gear and help me with my makeup? I got you. Maybe he can help me with mine too? Denki was already up and trotting to the curtains, narrowly missing tripping over the wires on the floor. Idiot. He soon returned with a reluctant Bakugu and a chipper Kirishima who was chatting with present Mike and dragging Katsuki along. Got him. Though has anyone seen Benjiro? He hasn't shown yet. What? Does anyone know where he is? Jiro slipped her silenced phone from her pocket to be faced with no new notifications. Bakugu dove straight for her makeup bag, finding the wanted items and turning back to her. Tilt your head up, bitch. Ha, huh? nice to see you too, ho. Jiro angled her face to give Bakugu better access. But seriously, any word from him dash. Uh, he's calling right now. Kaminari exclaimed, pressing the answer icon and pulling the phone to his ear. Ben, dude, you're running seriously late dash. A beat of silence. Uh, seriously? Come on, man. Judging by Kaminari uncharacteristic yelling, Jiro could tell that whatever Benjiro was saying was not good. Fine, be that way. Kaminari huffed hanging up the phone and sitting it face down onto the makeup station next to him. What was that about? Shinso called from his place on the other side of Jiro, not looking away from the mirror. Apparently Benjiro quits. Jiro was glad that she wasn't the one who was doing her makeup, because she would have completely ruined it. Present Mike halted his conversation with Kirishima, and if he was a dog, his ears would have been poking up. A band member ditched you? Kaminari nodded solemnly, eh? said he's too nervous and that he couldn't take the pressure of being in the band anymore. Jiro frowned. Benjiro wasn't the type to randomly drop out of anything without a notice. Though he wasn't one to stay committed either. She was surprised to learn that he even wanted to stick with their band through high school, especially when most of the other members quit. She was pissed though, that it had to be now of all times that he finally dropped out. That's no good, what does he play? Present Mike asked. We may be able to find someone who can sub in for him. He's our drummer, and a good one at that. I can't believe he would just quit like that. Yosetsu huffed, standing from his booth to approach them. How are we going to find someone that's skilled in such a short notice? I would offer our drummer, but... Jiro cut her teacher off, no, he's got to focus on your band, not ours. Besides, it won't be too hard to find such a talented and experienced drummer, I'm sure we can figure it out. She hummed, looking pointedly to Bakugu, who sat crouched in front of her zoned out. Move your fucking head, he grumbled, what were you saying? Cat, 
I think they want you to be their drummer. Ijiro offered, nudging him slightly with his foot. Get your dirty ass shoe off of me, Bakugu swatted him away. Then he halted his makeup job, scrunching up his nose. So what, you want me to just fucking sight read the notes? You can do that? Present Mike asked, looking a bit surprised. Yeah, Jiro was surprised to find out that Bakugu too was a music prodigy like herself. Apparently he had been doing the drums since a very young age. His mom thought it would be a good way to convey his emotions non-lethally. A fucking course I can ready for the eyeliner? Jiro closed an eye, letting the blonde swipe a stupidly perfect wing in just one attempt. Seriously, what was he not good at? It was annoying. Well, looks like we found our drummer, Manga. You think you can show him the music notes to play while playing the song's lyrics on your front side? Shinso asked, getting a nod in affirmation from Manga. Hold the fuck up, I never said I would actually help. I'm supposed to be on a date with this idiot? Bakugu's sentence was muffled, he held the eyeliner cap between his teeth. No, I don't mind Kirishima chirped, I think it's manly that you're going to step in like that. Bakuga's eyes flashed up to Jiro's, anything in it for me? Jiro smirked, oh yeah. Apparently the popularity and money were good reasons, but what pushed Bakugu over the edge was the fact that All Might would be attending. Apparently he really wanted to impress him. What a fanboy. Bakugu made quick work of his own makeup, changing into a red tank top and black cargo pants and chains. Kirishima made a quick run back to his house to grab the clothes, Bakugu insisting on the tank top to allow for a better drumming job. Drummers deserved mad respect in Jiro's opinion. They threw their whole upper body into the music. Hell, they created the beat. If the drummer messed up then everyone messed up. And yeah, their arms were always ripped. Nothing to complain about there. The crowd was huge, the largest one Jiro had ever performed in front of. She could spot her classmates and teachers sitting in the front, looking up at her with encouraging eyes. Everything above them was obscured by the spotlight. Jiro loved the spotlight shining directly in her face, it felt right to be under it. It also hid her vision from all of the prying eyes. Yes, Jiro lived for performing, but that didn't mean that she never got nervous. Like now. Looking out at the waves of heads, all eyeing her expectantly, her voice caught in her throat. Shit. She clenched her fist, her purple and black shirt shimmered under the light. It was about time to start, so why didn't she? She should have signaled for Bakugu to start drumming by now, but she couldn't bring herself to lift her hand. People in the crowd started whispering to each other and Jiro could almost hear the things they were saying. She knew she wouldn't be good enough, she knew she wasn't prepared. So why did she accept to be here if she was only going to screw up her teacher's performance? She felt her breaths picking up. Oh God, what was present Mike going to say? The drums started behind her, picking up a harsh, furious beat. She jumped and twisted around to see her band members looking at her expectantly. Bakugu continued playing a slow staccato version of the beat to the song they were opening up with, drumsticks twirling in his hands with an eased expertise. He was in his element. Then he pointed a drum. Stick up to get the crowd's attention. By now the lights shifted to cover him. All right, people. He yelled so loud that he didn't even need a microphone to be heard clearly by the crowd. Prepare to be fucking shell-shocked. Are you ready? Jiro knew what he was doing, he was getting the crowd hyped up, while at the same time buying her time to collect herself. She steeled herself, gathering her confidence and turning back to the mic. That was lame. Louder if you want us to play for you. The crowd reacted well to Bakugu's goading, roaring loud enough that Jiro could feel the vibrations on the stage below her. She was ready, she could do this. I'll take it. Bakugu grinned savagely, satisfied. He bounced in his chair as he picked up the pace, eyes occasionally looking back up to the notes Manga projected in front of him. Confidence surged through Jiro as she felt the adrenaline pump through her veins. She didn't even have to think about the notes or words as she sang, completely forgetting about the crowd in front of her as she felt the music. Something about Bakuga drumming was completely different from Benjiro's, it was harsher, more precise and full of passion. It lit an unholy fire under Jiro and the rest of the band's hearts as they played the best performance they ever performed before. They received a standing ovation once finished, the applause was deafening and it was music to Jiro's ears.
Wow, Kaminari giggled, now that was unbelievable. They all slumped down on the couches behind stage, performers high fading away. Coming down from it was Jiro's favorite feeling, so she basked in it, a dorky smile on her face. That was the best show we've ever done. Yosetsu grinned, distributing out water bottles to them. Bakuga man, that was some amazing drumming. I'm amazed you could do that well on the spot. Tis, Bakugu panted, chugging down the water bottle in one swig. Sweat beaded his body and his arm muscles pulsated. Jiro could tell that those were going to be sore in the morning. It was mediocre. Wait till you see me with some good fucking practice. Jiro grinned slyly, opening her own water bottle. Does this mean you'll join then? There was a pause as Bakugu's fiery red gaze swept across the room, studying the scene. I'll take you up on that fucking offer. Jiro was glad that things turned out the way they did. Even if they lost a band member, they gained another valuable one in his loss. And damn was Bakugu a good drummer.